Dr. Mike, what are you doctor of, sir? Um, let me check my University of Phoenix online diploma. Mm -hmm. Stinky mattress in the, the bottom of a um, unmarked van. That was much earlier in my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to get into that so fast. But in any case, let me, and inevitably some assholes like, don't overcomplicate, bro. Just lift and eat. Mm -hmm. As I want to say like, oh, I understand you're stupid, <laughs> but other people may be more intelligent and can actually consume this content. <laughs> Does the extent that they can continue making progress, is it different from individuals who are on gear? Do they not have to worry about getting stronger as much as naturals yeah. do? A lot of the natty people will say, we just got to focus on strength because all that other shit like pump work doesn't work. That's actually bullshit. Pump work works for everyone. Oh, you guys have a yeah. shitty guest on your podcast. <laughs> You just mentioned that you don't have to do compound moves to continue to get bigger. As much as it hurts my soul to say that scientifically, I have to say that's correct. What about kind of like the difference between like a full range motion, range of motion in something like a hack squat versus doing like a partial range of motion in a hack squat where you're like literally just kind of chasing the pump? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember this. I remember what this. Is this is a I long time it. ago. From what I understand, muscles don't really necessarily understand what's going on. They just are told like, oh, we got to move you know, this shin bone this way. Yes. Is there an issue with like not moving that much weight? Like if the yeah, muscles yeah. are still tired, fatigued yeah. and sore, like, is there a problem there? I always find it interesting that, uh, so many things seem to go back to bodybuilding. Somebody talks about a diet and they're like, oh, you can do this diet. You can do that diet. You can do a keto diet or you can do if it fits your macros. But ultimately when people are trying to get in shape, it comes down to, you got to kind of follow a bodybuilding style diet when sure. someone's trying to get like shredded. No, I like the mystery. Mm -hmm. I want to see your fing dick. I could have told you that. You like, had one of those. It's like dude lingerie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Except, I get it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I have like a nut hanging out, but no, not everything. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what the other nut looks like. <laughs> so, my question to you is if an individual is interested in getting into bodybuilding, getting into the hat side of bodybuilding, Number one, how can they make sure that they have longevity intact? Are you a shower or a grower? You're like, ha ha. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bad Project Family, how's it going now? On this podcast, we talk a lot about getting your lab work done. That's why we've partnered with Merrick Health. They're a telehealth network and they're owned by Derek for more plates, more dates. But the amazing thing about Merrick is that when you when they get your labs done, they have a client care coordinator go over those labs with you. Now, a lot of you, when you guys are looking at labs and looking at your testosterone, cholesterol, et cetera, what Merrick Health does is they don't immediately throw a needle at you, okay? They can help you figure out what type of things you need to do in terms of your nutrition, potentially what you need to do through your supplementation. And if you're someone who potentially has hormonal issues, whether you're advanced in age or you do have very low testosterone, Merrick will put you on a protocol that is specific to you and that helps you out with your current levels. The problem with a lot of these other telehealth networks is that when they do HRT for individuals, they give everybody the same exact thing. And that can actually damage you and not be beneficial. That's why Merrick Health's the way to go. And Andrew, how do they go about it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com. That's M-A-R-E-K health.com. And let's say you just you just want to get your testosterone checked, or maybe you want to get your testosterone, your estrogen, and a couple of other things. Uh, load all those labs into your cart, and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off all those labs. But let's say you're not sure where to start. Head over to MerrickHealth.com slash POWERPROJECT and get the Power Project panel. That's going to cover everything you need to know including a uh, consultation with a client care coordinator uh, that comes free with that and use promo code power project to save hundred and one dollars off of that entire bundle again merrickhealth.com links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes oh there we go Ooh, okay yeah yeah i guess yeah the closer the better yep. dr mike what are you doctor of sir um let me check my university of phoenix online diploma yeah? I forget what they put on there. Because oh. you pay the money and you, I sort of was like, I don't care. Just you got to go to school a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't really, you know. Write some sort of thesis. $199 to the PayPal account of University of Phoenix Online mm. and I went to school. Mm. Uh, for real, for real though, sport physiology, oh. which is more or less the science of taking good athletes and making them better. Mm. I didn't mean to look at you when I said good athletes. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, but I did mean to look at Mark when I said better athletes. Oh, oh. <laughs> this is going to be how it is all day long. And I'm ready for it. Uh, excellent. Got to be on your toes. I guess it depends on what our definition of well, athlete is. If like uh, may, maybe, maybe for you, you're, you really admire the guy that can't tie his shoes. That's just the athleticism in its own right. Yeah, the guy that I has tried. to stuff his feet into his shoes. Well, think about it. Like most people, muscular feet. Yeah. 
first of all. Second of all, most people tie their shoes just fine, right? And you notice they're not struggling. So on the one hand, mm. great. On the other hand, they're not getting a training effect. If it's difficult for you to tie your shoes, ostensibly you get better at doing it. Something must hypertrophy. Maybe it's lower back. Maybe it's your desire to continue living like this. Guys, Something's this is a give. fucking doctor. Mm -hmm. and so he knows what he's talking about. I, I couldn't agree more. Real doctor. <laughs> Let's get to the question that everyone's wondering, though. Are you natty or not? Uh, I'm joking. Where's my lawyer? But how are you? Okay, no, so I'm not. <laughs> this is a wild thing. You're 250 pounds. And I was curious. Drug free. Like, drug free. <laughs> but <laughs> for today, be <laughs> before we got on the mic uh, last five minutes, two hours ago. <laughs> okay. Before we got on the mic, I was curious, like what your weight would be, because you like what your weight would be if you weren't. And you mentioned that you were 270 before anything. Yeah. yeah. How? Um, whole milk and uh, a willingness to tell your digestive system that. <laughs> While it does get a say in what happens, it doesn't get all the say. Mm. Oh, I'm not hungry. Shut up, body. <laughs> More food, mm -hmm. lifting weights, um, you know, watching cartoons in the morning, just like any American kid. God dang. American. Um, yeah, no, it sucked, but like basically, when did I? Fuck it, I'll just talk about it, whatever. I was 27 when I hopped on, mm -hmm. and uh, before then I had gotten up to, well, so my freshman year of high school, I was... I wrestled 103. I was like 5'2 or yeah. something. I was, yeah. I was huge. People feared me <laughs> when they could spot me in a crowd. Uh -huh. And uh, then I started lifting weights more or less the summer of my freshman to sophomore year. And I was, I wrestled 119 my sophomore year. Then I wrestled 135 junior year. And then I wrestled 160 my senior year. And I uh, kept lifting weight, uh, uh, kept uh, lifting weights. And then my freshman year of college, I was 180. Sophomore year of college, I was 200. Mm. Junior year, I was a significantly fatter, but I felt still pretty sexy, 220. Did you wrestle in college too? I didn't. I just didn't. Uh, power lifted in college. Okay. Yep. Uh, wrestled, but it wasn't what you would call competitive wrestling. More like cooperative wrestling <laughs> on camera. I didn't mean to look at you for a very long time when I said that. <laughs> uh -oh. Or did I? <laughs> apartment wrestling, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. like a barn, apartment, yeah. alley. That yeah. used to be frowned Back upon. Of a now, van. You got, yeah. now you got OnlyFans. You can make a lot of money. Well, also, <laughs> if you have a van properly rigged up with like 3D cameras, little mattress, mm -hmm. stinky mattress in the, the bottom of a, um unmarked van. That was much earlier in my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't to, I didn't mean to get into that so fast. But in any case, let me, let me finish the actual story. Not a lot of windows. What the hell right? we're <laughs> Zero windows. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, yeah, only God can see in there. Also <laughs> Satan. Anyway. <laughs> Um, 220, <laughs> drug-free, junior year, pretty fat. I got up to, uh, early in grad school, I got up to 255, very drug-free and very fat. Mm -hmm. And I was like, blah, I felt like shit. So I got a little lighter. And then over the course of my PhD program, I worked back up to 270. I remember weighing in at 280 in the evening, drug-free, uh, fat, but strong. Yeah. Um, and I had muscle. I was probably like... 30% body fat, mm -hmm. which is a lot, but it's not like untrained, yeah. you know? And then I decided that uh, I was going to make a nice relationship with chemical substances that we started our romance and when I was 27. And then I never got to 270 again, but I was a leaner version of every single body weight. So I came back down and then up, down and up. And right now I'm like 250 and, you know. It looks pretty cool. Much, much leaner 250 than I have ever been. And you can breathe while talking behind yeah, a mic. Insane. That's one, like, you see a lot of guys who are like, 250. Yeah. And you're started. not that sweaty yet. Yeah. Well, this is California, so mm. you guys don't have humidity. I may never sweat here. <laughs> yeah, In Michigan, I just sweat all the fucking time. Mm. Damn. It's a great place. Yeah. Um, so when you, you made that switch and you got on some stuff, you were, were you attempting to get leaner or did it just kind of just part of the process? Um, the only reason I got onto stuff was to see how far my body could go. And I began to attempt to get leaner very shortly after getting on mm. and it worked. And I was like, holy shit, except I didn't really know anything about uh, managing like more or less estrogen side effect and androgen side effect, uh, body water. So I was bloated as all hell and messed up my first several bodybuilding shows. Just have no, no, no idea about body water. Then I got with broader Chavez, um, farm coach basically and after some trials and tribulations we solved that problem and then voila striated glutes 
And then I post them on Instagram. They fucking ban me for that shit. Really? Yeah. So that's why you made that new account. Oh, your glutes look great. Of course you can swear. I don't, I don't know. This is a family podcast. PG-13. You folks look nice, you know. Glutes. Oh, how much did you weigh there? Don't post that, bro. We're going to get fucking canceled. You no, want your YouTube late. canceled? No, we're good. How oh. much did I weigh to fuck if I know what is it to say anything? Um, <laughs> Intima has good. <laughs> I like the first comment. <laughs> Gay. <laughs> oh, so somebody commented that? <laughs> yeah. That's nice. You know, I'm not, not going to repeat that word. <laughs> Let me see here. Real fast. Uh, so if that was from uh, earlier, uh, uh, late last year, I must have weighed about 230 there. Wow. 230. To anywhere between 225 <clears throat> and 230. And you got on stage at that point too? or uh, So I got on stage. I weighed in at 225.4, and then I actually got on stage at 217 yeah, this because is my a, body stores a ton of water. Jesus Holy Christ. shit. 222. What the hell happened to his glutes? Wow. And are those your underwear? Uh, yes. <laughs> Digital rendering. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you guys want to know a really crazy secret? Yeah, I was so. naked in that picture. Oh, no. Don't goodness. tell anybody. And it is actually really funny how many people on Instagram will draw attention to that. And, mm -hmm. and I, I always go with them to see how far they'll keep taking it. But it turns out there was just one awkward remark. They're like, Dr. Mike, are you really naked? I'm like, yes. Do you want to know more? They're like, no, not really. I was like, why you, <laughs> you could have answered that question for yourself. God damn it. Can't you see it's digital underwear? Yeah. Zoom in. Do you guys do a lot of this on Instagram? You scroll, scroll, and then you're like, Yes. Oh. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know you could do my that. My eyes just aren't weird. that great. No, it's, it's an so eye it's thing. Just, it's not a pervert thing. No. Of course not. That's what I tell myself. Yeah. Zooming in and check it out a little further. Investigation. Investigation. I, I like, yes, I'm like a law enforcement officer in, in some sense in my own head. Mm -hmm. But the law is people's butt cracks I want to see on Instagram. Mm. And I'm enforcing it. I don't know. Yeah. I it's, had nothing after so that. So having this doctor <laughs> science -y background stuff, um, how much of the science are you able to utilize in your own training and in, in assisting other people? Because uh, like studies on uh, like biomechanics and studies on like stuff related to squats and deadlifts and these mm -hmm. various things um, can sometimes be hard to extract information from from time to time due to like the way the study's sure. done and due to the fact that people are just so different. Um, so how do you like, re I guess, rely on some of that science to incorporate into the way that you might help people or even help yourself? Yeah, great question. So... There are different levels to science. There is basically a spectrum in science of basic all the way to applied. Like basic science kind of tells you how chemicals work and how structures work, how physics works. And all the way to a super applied science is like glute ham raise technique, two different ways. We studied two subjects and figured out which one quote unquote works best. And I think that that applied stuff is what most people sort of resonates with them as, oh, this is science for training. Mm -hmm. They read one, you know, PubMed article that's like answers a very, very specific question about an exercise or something like that. But most of the science that we use at RP is a more basic, maybe intermediate science of like, well, how do joints work? How do muscles work? How does muscle growth happen? Taking a look at all the training studies or as many of them as we can find all together, what can we tease apart as far as like generally what is good technique? Like, is it a good idea to go for the deep stretch? We look that in, up and there's like, you know, a dozen studies that say, tension under a deep stretch for the muscle is more muscle growth promoting than just going through a partial range. So we look at that and we go, okay, it's probably a good idea. But we also know that there are pretty decent proxies in the gym that you can feel yourself that have been scientifically validated at least some extent to correlate to growth so you can be your own guide. So you just like read science and go do shit. And you're like, I can hope science works this time. You go, okay, like what are the downstream effects of training really hard? Well, for example, if you're training your quads, if the muscle itself feels weak after training, if the muscle itself gets crampy or strained, you know, like when you really like overdo your quads, you're like, I can't, I don't know what's going on. Am I, is my <laughs> knee locked out or not? Soreness, pump, those are all pretty well mechanistically tied to muscle growth, either as causes of it or as kind of symptoms of the process that made muscle grow. So if someone, you know, if you see, if you derive a good exercise technique from science, you think, ah, this should work. If you try it and it feels like fuck all happened to your quads, for example, you're like, eh, I guess science, you know, zigged when it should have zagged or something. But if you try it and you're like, holy shit, my quads, then you're probably onto something. Mm -hmm. You do that process enough and then you develop a set of general principles for technique, general principles for training frequency, exercise selection, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden you have the drum roll, dr -dr -dr -dr, scientific principles of hypertrophy training available on Amazon. It's a book I wrote, a little book, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of selfies of my genitals in there, but if you can get through that part, you'll learn a lot. They're blurred. 
Um, that's what the lawyers say we should say. Good. But they're not always blurred. Mm. It was a printer issue. That's what it was. It was difficult to blur them. Mm-hmm. Is it true that we need to like push harder <laughs> all the time? Because like, you know, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just an interesting thing. Like, uh, I guess, you know, like, do we need to do more reps? Do we need more weight? Do we need like a different mm-hmm. stimulus to grow? Or uh, could somebody just kind of hang out in a certain area and continue to make progress, maybe look better? Um, can it get stronger doing similar weights? Or do you always have to do like either like more reps or more overall volume? Or like continuous more progressive overload forever. Eventually I become God. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're all here, right? Really good question. So there's a couple ways to answer this, but I will say a good way to think about it is there is like a, all the stuff you're able to do. Here's your maximum ability to do anything in one day. Like how many reps of squats can you really do until you collapse or some mm-hmm. shit like that? And down here is you sitting in a chair and not even going to work out. The top, oh, maybe 10% of that effort spectrum is where gains happen. So if you get to the top 7%, and then you just decide not to change anything for a while. It takes a while for you to get so much more able that that top seven dips into like the five, mm. 92, five, 90, 88, five. You've talked about this before. So your capacity is continuing to kind of move. Hopefully. So like if you are getting stronger, then you should be exiting. So for example, if a hundred pounds is challenging to you, can you get stronger using it? Yes. Then you're 102.5 pounds strong. Is a hundred pounds still challenging? Yes, but marginally less so. Mm-hmm. so. Like how many months or weeks can you still train with a hundred to get strong? Well, let's define strength as productive training in sets of three to six repetitions and then hypertrophy everything north of that. You know what I'm saying? When you're doing like sets of five with a hundred and it's challenging, it's close to failure. Absolutely. You're getting stronger. When it's sets of six, a few weeks later, hey, you got stronger sets of six, right? When it's sets of seven, eight, nine, ten, a few months later, is that the most efficient way to get stronger? No, because the reps are too high. The load isn't good enough. So the, to answer your question of can I just keep doing the same thing and, and, and get stronger or get better at anything, the answer is absolutely yes for some time. But eventually that curve leaves you and you got to like do cooler shit, do more intense shit, do elevate the stimulus so that you can continue to be challenged in that zone. It's almost like asking a similar question of like, like if you're a musical artist – and you make a certain kind of sound that people really like to hear, Mm -hmm. can you just keep doing that formula? Yeah, for a while until that shit isn't cool anymore. And then you have to innovate. Like like Madonna's been pretty good at like continuing to make herself more relevant. So you could say like, well, why don't you just stick to the formula that works from the 80s, Madonna? She'd be like, for a while it did, but then it didn't. So if people ask the question of, I'm trying to get Jack, can I just do one thing and not change it? The answer is yes, until the answer is no. And then you're not improving anymore, can you imagine like you hire a coach and he's like, oh, you're not improving. This is going to be a fucking really difficult technical assignment for me to figure out how to make you better. And he's like, what have you been trying? You're like, nothing. I've just been doing the same shit for four years. He's going to be like, holy fuck, this is the easiest shit I've ever done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, but there is something there that some people have no problem going super fucking hard. And they maybe get so nervous and anxious about like, am I really doing a good enough job? And to those people, I say, like, as long as you're getting some soreness, some pump for strength. Like you feel really challenged. Mm -hmm. Like if at some point in strength training, you get one, a few of these reps, you're going to continue to get stronger. The pace can be different depending on if you optimize, your pace can be this strong like this, not optimize and just do a good job. is like this, but you're still getting stronger over time. Yeah. If you're not challenging yourself or if your recovery food, et cetera, is bad enough, you will quite clearly see that you're not getting stronger. And then if you're no longer getting stronger, bigger, whatever, then clearly you have to do something else. But you can coast for a while on, on regular shit. And if you're an overthinker and over warrior, just coast, just do the right stuff for a while. And at some point you may look back on a year and be like, well, I just got stronger this entire time. Why would I make things overcomplicated? Whereas if at some point month eight, you stop getting stronger, it's time to overcomplicate. Mm-hmm. Which actually like, you see this kind of comment on social media a lot. Like you throw some science at a motherfucker like, hey, like try this. And inevitably some asshole's like, fucking overcomplicate, bro. Just fucking lift and eat. Mm-hmm. As I want to say like, oh, I understand you're stupid. <laughs> but other people may be more intelligent and can actually consume this content. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's like seeing like, you know, technical analysis of military, like Russia versus Ukraine. Like, fuck that. Just nuke them all. Like, hey, thanks a lot, Jim. You're the man. C- kindly see yourself the fuck out of this conversation. Yeah. But um, at the end, at the, at the same time, you know, well, we don't have to overcomplicate everything. If it works, Great. But to those people that say like, fuck that, just eat and lift and whatever, like true until it's not enough. Mm -hmm. Like, can you imagine like 
<clears throat> not like like take someone like Big Rami, right? And he's like, hey, like, I wonder what kind of peaking protocol I should use with drugs and training and food and all that stuff. Can you imagine telling him, like, don't overfuck, complicate it, bro. Just eat and lift. He's like, no shit, motherfucker. I'm 345 at 8% body fat. You didn't think I've been doing that shit already? Like, yeah. to win the Olympia, you got to do a little bit more than, than just do shit. So mm -hmm. I think, like, uh, TLDR, use as much science as you need to continue to progress. Yeah. And if you're not progressing anymore, maybe you're not working hard enough. Science can help you figure that out. Or maybe you're just uh, not nuanced and complicated enough, which sucks if you're dumb and you can't figure that shit out, hire a coach. But if you're sufficiently intelligent, yeah, some science sprinkled on that shit, you know, hard work and basics, sprinkle some science on it, and then you continue to get better. On the idea of getting stronger, you made a video um, that- I've you, never made any videos. You haven't. There's the, <laughs> there, This one, I don't know why it's coming to mind, but <laughs> you made this video about naturals having to get stronger. Mm -hmm. So when, when I saw that, I was, I was curious, like, does the extent that they can continue making progress, is it different from individuals who are on gear? Do they not have to worry about getting stronger as much as naturals yeah. do? Because I want to mention something that I noticed when I started focusing on strength training. From the time I was 13 to about 22, none of my training was focused on strength. I was just increasing volume because I also did sports at the time. And oh, damn. I, like, I wasn't focusing on increasing the strength of my squat, deadlift, et cetera. After I did my first few shows in my off season, I was like, okay, I'm bored. Let me get some powerlifting and let me get mm -hmm. stronger. And noticed a big progression into, like, it was like that year. You I started like, gaining muscle. Fuck. I started continue, I started getting, it was like newbie gains sure. again. And I put on quite a bit of weight because I was getting stronger. And then I was like, oh, so... All this stuff is easier because now I'm getting stronger and I'm getting bigger. And that was a big, it's like a key unlocked for me. Sure. Um, but do you think that individuals who are on gear, is that not as much of a concern? I think it's as much of a concern, but individuals who get on gear have another variable to play with and they can pay less attention to their training quality and training design and still make gains by either riding out however much gear has going for them or incrementally increasing the gear when they reach problem areas. So someone's like, yeah, man, I really can't get my lower back to pop out. Trend goes from 500 to 700, next prep. Like, okay. I did it. <laughs> like, okay. Um, but underlying mechanisms are still the same. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are drug using or drug free, your ability to get stronger over time in sets of five to 30 repetitions is the, the easily the best correlate in the real world to show you that you're getting more muscular. Yeah. And if you think you've gotten more muscular, but your lifts haven't gone up for reps, it strains the imagination as to what really actually happened. Mm. Yeah, so you, can, you guys ever like, see, this is another piece, more me talking shit. Like some, some bodybuilder will post on Instagram and it's like a before and after or a side by side. And they're like, I, felt, I didn't get any stronger this, this off season, but I felt like I'm bringing more quality. And you're looking at the picture like, it was a minute out. And you're like, motherfucker, are you out of your mind? <laughs> uh, 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 one of those like, I don't know which one's the better picture. Which, did you get weaker? That sucks. So if you track your reps and sets and how strong you are for reps, both seeking to increase the strength a little bit over time and using the strength as a barometer of am I doing a good job is a swell idea for everyone, mm -hmm. drug free or not. A lot of the natty people will say, we just got to focus on strength. There's all that other shit like pump work doesn't work. That's actually bullshit. Pump work works for everyone. It's been vetted actually exclusively in naturals. Pump Can work. you explain mm -hmm. pump work, by the way, yeah. for those? So and any kind of muscle growth training that results in a temporary cell swelling response for the muscles, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. the pump, the only reason to be alive, maybe, or it's like coming or something. It's Whatever. It's like coming. coming. <laughs> <laughs> Look at my pump. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, have a, I have a shitty Arnold impression. It's great. I mean, it's shitty. <laughs> <laughs> so the pump actually, so back in the day, they used to say that it was nothing. It was just blood. It was irrelevant. And uh, especially in the last five years, there have been- What is wrong with us? Why do, why do we say stuff's irrelevant? You know, it's like, it seems well, so obvious it makes, that it like yeah. does something. Your arms swell up, they get bigger yeah, like, right maybe, there on the spot. Oh, that doesn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, so I, I would categorize, I would go even further. Um, there's uh, two ways to say it. You could say, well, it's not really, there's no evidence that the pump makes you more jacked, which was true in the 90s. There was no evidence for it. But not having evidence for something is very different than there being evidence against it. Mm -hmm. So you say the pump doesn't do anything. And my retort was like, well, how do you know that? They're like, well, it's just self swelling. I'm like, how do you know that's not mechanistically tied to growth? And they'd be like, what's mechanistically mean, you fucking nerd asshole? <laughs> and then I would get punched in the face, <laughs> I would begin to cry. <laughs> And then I would do curls so that I never got hit in the face again. And my face got bigger, so now it's hard to punch. Your face is very muscular. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <That was a compliment>. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, the pump has been shown in numerous studies that is cell swelling to actually be a, a, a trigger of hypertrophy. It actually grows muscle for you to get a pump. Mm -hmm. And also I the- I knew it. Yeah, yeah. The metabolites, like all that, you know, the painful burn stuff in the muscles yeah. that actually causes a pump. Um, the metabolites themselves also grow muscle. And the production of tension over multiple repetitions through a large range of motion also causes a pump. And that tension also hypertrophies you. So not only is the pump actually causative of muscle growth, it's an excellent correlate of muscle growth. Mm. You say, try to figure a way out, oh, how does that not apply? Well, hold on a sec. So off season, guys get huge ass pumps, right? They also grow a lot. Pre-contest, worse pumps. That's not an accident. That's not by accident. So having a, a pre-swollen cell already, tons of glycogen in it, being fresh. You guys know how if you're super fatigued, you actually can't get that great of a pump, but yeah. if you're fucking post-deload, you're like, oh my fucking God. Mm -hmm. So all that stuff adds up and it turns out the pump actually works. So, you know, if you're getting really great pumps, that's a probably pretty good sign mm -hmm. that everything's going well in your life. But if you're not getting great pumps, it's terrible. And if you're drug-free, training that makes you progressively stronger mm -hmm. while utilizing tension metabolites and things that result in a pump are all really great things to use. Yeah. Same thing for guys on gear. But again, the confounding factor is guys on gear can sometimes get away with real dumb shit just because they can just keep upping the dose. And they're like, how, how come pro? And a lot of times people try to learn from that and they're learning from a mistake. Mm. So say, well, man, pro bodybuilders don't use full ROM. How come they're fucking big? You're like, well, it's two things. One, how do you know that if they didn't use full ROM, they'd be bigger? The second thing, this is going to be mean. This is a mean comment. Not all, but a significant fraction of high-level bodybuilders they're not kind of, kind of people that you take advice from on anything. And it's easy to fanboy the fuck out of these people. You never met them, never mm -hmm. talked to them, but you meet and talk to these motherfuckers and you're like, holy shit, you have no idea what's going on. I mean, like in your personal life as well as <laughs> lifting. And you say like, you know, what's the rationale for you doing curls like this or like that? And like, you know what I'm saying, man? Just getting after it. You're like, ah, <laughs> let me write that down. It's <laughs> <laughs> fucking brilliant. <laughs> Einstein, Newton, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Same, so Mount Rushmore of science right here. So yeah. a lot of times before looking up to people, it's maybe look, look if they have a modicum of intelligence because like they can't give you their genetics, right? Like I can't look at someone's bicep peaks and be like, I can has, I mean, you can ask, <laughs> but maybe you can touch it. Maybe they'll let you rub your face no, on they'll it. They'll let you ideally. touch it. Ideally. Oh yes, they they'll will. let you touch it. Everything for a price in bodybuilding, of course. Yeah. But if you actually want to learn stuff from people, maybe like, maybe <clears> try to, See some YouTube videos of theirs if they, if they sound like they've thought shit through. Now, some people are not very verbally oriented or even communicative, but they could have a very decent philosophy of training. Maybe at some point someone sort of gets that out of them. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at their training, you follow them on social media, maybe try to see if you can discern some kind of structure or pattern. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't discern a pattern, maybe there's not a pattern. And then maybe like when you ask the guy, like, so what do you think about best tricep exercises? Whatever dumb shit comes out of his mouth is not an intelligent assessment of the world. Mm. It's just like, well, I, I feel like X, Y, Z. Like, I, I could have fucking told you that. Thanks for nothing. Yeah. And, then, and you ask, why is that guy jacked? 15 years of lifting, amazing genetics. He was that guy in high school that you were like, how old are you kidding? 38? <laughs> Fuck, you have a mustache. We're in freshman year of high school. <laughs> That's probably you guys, huh? That was Nsema for sure. Nsema was beating I up did adult not, man. Nsema got 10. checked for his birth certificate. Yeah, when I was 16 yep. playing soccer, the up. parents on the other team were like, I want that kid's birth certificate. <laughs> you know you're Nigerian when. <laughs> <laughs> he was also a medical doctor at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know that one? Uh, yeah. No? Um, oh. You talking about the black kid who was like, uh, he had a clinic? No, no. no? I, was, I was referencing oh. nothing specific. I just have, I've never met a single Nigerian that wasn't an exceptional mm. athlete, medical doctor, or computer engineer. Yeah. Makes Maybe sense. chemical systems engineer or something. Yeah, it, it's, a few of those. it's in the culture. Doctor, lawyer, Un engineer. Unbelievable. I actually was, uh, I was in the hospital once and I had a doctor who was Nigerian. I was like, can I ask you like sort of a personal question? And she's like, Jesus Christ. And she didn't say that. She was like, yes. I was like, you know, what's it like if you're a Nigerian family and you decide not to go to school, like to college? And she, they, she literally did the same thing you just did. She's just like, that's not a thing that happens. I was like, well, well, like pretend. And she's like, there would be a 30 person extended family sit down intervention to make sure you went to school. She thought I was asking a different That's what happened she, to me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you went to school and they're like, shut up. Uh, yeah, and it, what she thought I was asking was, what if they go for a non-STEM degree? <laughs> oh, so she's like, if you try to like major in English, they will still sit down with you and be like, are you sure about this? No, no yeah. art, no philosophy, no nothing like that. <laughs> that doesn't like bring that, home the bacon. No, it's not a real degree. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, I love it. But so, a, a quick add-on question to that, because uh -huh. like, um, do you think that when I mentioned that I wasn't focusing on getting stronger, like I was doing like my excess, what people would call accessory movements, mm -hmm. but I was not focusing on getting stronger on big compound movements. Mm -hmm. And that is, 
and that is something that like made a big difference for me when I started doing mm -hmm. that along with all of the bodybuilding work. Sure. And my rationale for that was because I can move so much more vol volume with these movements sure. that it was beneficial. Do you think that is something necessary for natural athletes to do or can they just focus on maybe progressing some machine movements, et cetera. They don't need to do big compounds to get a breakthrough in their yeah. training. I, I would put a lot of money in my entire professional reputation on the fact that you don't need compound movements to progress. There we go. But for some people that works really well. And if you're one of those, so for me, like I never grew better than barbell rows, standing overhead presses, high bar squats, good morning, stiff legged deadlifts, all that stuff is fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. And when people like, um, say, well, you know, that stuff, I don't feel my hamstrings doing a stuff like a deadlift. I'm like, shut the fuck up. What are you, nuts? <laughs> but like, not maybe not everyone does. So yeah. I think if you find movements that work well for you, work mm -hmm. well for your body, and then you push them shits hard over time, adding a rep here and there, five pounds here and there, and after a while, you either jacked or it turns out you had shitty genetics the whole time. Yeah. Then you cry a lot. But yeah. you can cry a lot anyway. Yeah, th <clears throat> that was kind of a similar question that I had. Um, so like, I like to f focus on just chasing the pump sometimes because time's limited. Um, I train, uh, like I get a lot of my training ideas from my buddy, Doug Brignoli, which I know you just recently crossed paths with. Um, Eye lasers. It, <laughs> but is, is there like a, I guess, is it a mistake to just like go in and chase the pump like more often than, I don't know, trying to like, I'm going to go deadlift or something. Like, you know, I don't want to really do the big three right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm just focusing on more of the hypertrophy stuff. And then like, yeah, just getting after the pump. Yeah. So like if you're consistently getting really good pumps, you will probably continue to hypertrophy for some time, which you may find at some point is, is pump is subjective. And you may find that like, I'm getting good pumps, but maybe I could get great pumps if I pushed harder. Uh, yeah, no, and you, really, and then you have to ask yourself mm. the question of how much harder. Mm. And you don't actually know until you start referencing your performance to an objective standard. Mm -hmm. but so how much harder can I do these pull-ups? Well, how many pull-ups can I do if gone to my head? 12, okay. Well, I've been doing six. So that's six reps in reserve. Let's look at the old scientific literature. Oh, turns out I'm a fucking idiot and I haven't been going hard enough. And then you think you're getting pumps and you go and fucking do a set of 11 in the pull-ups and you're like, holy lats. And like, ah, okay, now I'm really getting pumps. And then, so by referencing yourself to objective standards of strength, if you find that your training is not going great and you're not making progress, that's the real fucking easy way. Because if, if, for example, if you're barbell bent rowing 185 for sets of 10 and your bodybuilding coach is like, or whatever, your TikTok influencer fans mm -hmm. are like, you need a, you need a bigger back. You suck. And you're like, oh no, commentator. You like their comment. You rearrange your whole life to get a bigger back. You should be curious as to, to see your barbell row go from 185 for 10 to like hopefully higher than that. Mm. Because if someone says, how do you know your back is growing? And I'm saying pictures can, lights different. Mm -hmm. You try to get set up with 24 hour fitness, but the 85 year old Chinese man knocked your camera down because <laughs> you're in a fucking public locker room. Fucking guy. Other people's dicks on the shit you have to get rid of. You know, the pictures. You guys know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking Tuesday about. Tuesday night. Yeah. So at some point, you know, you're, you don't want to not be sure that you're spending. Cause also here's another problem. You're in off season phase. You'll get a little fatter as well as muscular and the fat obscures the muscle. So someone's like, are you gaining muscle? You're like, I hope some shit's happening underneath there. Mm -hmm. And, but if you, a reference to a standard, 185 for 10 is my best bent row. And then it's a few months later, 195 for 10, a few months later, 205 for 10. And someone's like, Hey, is your back bigger? Like, well, gee whiz, you know, unless I'm getting unbelievable neural adaptations after years of knowing how to do barbell rows anyway, mm -hmm. the only way to get stronger in the barbell row is just fucking put on more muscle. And because I'm now doing 215 for sets of 10 instead of 185, hey, I'm all the way there. So to answer your question directly, pump work is totally fucking baller. But if it ever like not or works not so great for you, or if you feel like, mm, am I really doing what I can in the gym to get my best possible effort? Then I would start still train for pump, but reference your reps and sets. Cause like a set of 15 will get you a ball or bicep pump. Mm -hmm. A set of 16 with the same weight next week could give you a slightly better pump, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is it wise to try to select stuff that allows you to like lift more weight? As far as bodybuilding stuff? Yeah. As far so, as bodybuilding. Yeah. So... At the end of the day, you want to make sure that the target muscle or muscles are being stimulated and there are a limiting factor. And there are ways in which muscle stimulation and adding weight work very well together. And there are ways in which you could sort of take a little off tangent side road and then you're not on the freeway anymore. You're on that service drive and everyone's going 80 and you're going 55 and you're like, what the fuck am I doing? You pull off, hills have eyes, you die because, you know, the crazy people kill you. So in any case, if we say, okay, I'm going to be doing pull-ups. I'm going to be doing a full range of motion all the way up and down. Mm -hmm. And pull-ups allow me to put a shitload of tension through my lats because I'm doing like sets of five to 10. Mm -hmm. I might even use some weight. 
And then the answer is, you know, am I trying to put as much force to the muscle as possible? The answer to that is yes, because we're targeting the muscle properly and we're going through full range of motion. However, if you subvert those two things in chasing for the max numbers, then all of a sudden you're not really training that muscle anymore as much as you could be using other muscles and differences in the movement to make up for it. So say, oh man, I can really lift a lot if I do deadlifts from a rack position instead of from a low position. Okay. Like, does your, your glutes work more? Well, they actually work less because they don't get a stretch. So they grow less. So why the fuck are you doing that? Well, you can lift a lot of weight by distributing the effort between a ton of muscles and lowering the range of motion. And then you actually get less stimulus, but you get to look cooler. As usual, the girl in the gym sees you rack pulling and she's like, I need to be on your fucking dick right now. Every minute of my life has been pointless up until this moment. I yeah. finally discovered my purpose. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot with rack All pulls. the time. Yeah, it does. That's a good reason to use them. Yeah. Like, yeah, I didn't want to use rack pulls, but your boy got horny. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> These gym girls. Yeah. <laughs> and really just over accentuate the thrusting aspect of it. <laughs> so they know. So they know. So let, let the weight like slam down yeah. on the rack so Loudly. that they hear yeah. it. And then just, you know. Before um, I do my rack pull, I like to turn to whoever it is I'm trying to seduce. And I go, watch this. Yeah. <laughs> with and, the eyebrow pump like that? That was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like kind of The Rock, but like. Double eyebrow. I, I'm like The Rock if he was like significantly worse at everything than he is. Mm -hmm. Shorter, less jacked. I can't do all the faces. The Rock faces. How does he do it? Mm -hmm. But you're probably strong. But nearly than identical. I'm not strong on The Rock. I, I would say more you training are. volume than him. Mike, you are what, well, like, better like range. Very charitable. <laughs> it's like, it's like very telling specific. a race walker they're faster than someone. You're like, over time, you get <laughs> places that are further away. <laughs> and you're great. <laughs> I'm the race walking equivalent of bodybuilding. <laughs> That's what I am. Oh, you guys have God. a shitty guest on your podcast. Today. <laughs> well, actually, no, I think we can reliably say, uh, this is the second time I'm saying this, but you probably do have the most muscular face off of anyone we've had on the podcast. Yeah. I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of, do we have more muscular jawlines that, that we've... Um, oh, now he's flexing on us. <laughs> <laughs> he's biting down, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's... I, I'm proud of that. Hmm. I, I, I want to ask kind of on, on this, you know, when we as we're talking about compounds, one thing that you'll see a lot... <laughs> compounds. Oh, the lifts. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. We'll nah, get to those. Those other compounds. We'll get to those other compounds. Mm. But, um, you know, a, a lot of people are like, they... You just mentioned that you don't have to do compound movements to continue to get... Bigger. As much as it hurts my soul to say that scientifically, I have to say that's correct. And, and that's great because, you know, a lot of people, for example, don't like to bench press. Right. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> some people. Some people don't like. They. They'd Mike, rather come back. Come back, please, Mike. Don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm out. But you know, it, it, it. As far as like growing a chest, right? Um, would you? Would it be good for like for some individuals and to do dumbbell benching and yeah. flies, etc., oh, yeah. and just progress those movements over time to be able to achieve the same, Look like the same pecs. size for their chest or a big size for their chest? Stop. Stop. Look, I have rights. I'm not to be touched randomly. Oh, sorry. Sorry. This was just like kind of a me too moment that just mm -hmm. happened. I do it again. Mm. Well, it was hotter when like you didn't have permission to be honest. <laughs> Cause Mr. Olympia, Jay Cutler like swears by the bench press. He loves it. I love the bench press. Yeah. To me, the bench press is one of the best chest exercises I've ever done. Mm -hmm. The thing is for every single person, your anatomy is slightly different. You're built a little differently. Muscular insertions, muscle shape is different. Fiber types, different, blah, blah, all the way down the line. Also, technique will be a little different. Some people yeah. are like, I don't get anything out of the bench. You teach them how to archer and track, and they're like, holy shit, my pecs. like, you never knew how to bench press, sir. Mm -hmm. You just went to football camp, and they taught mm -hmm. you how to bench. So do you guys remember the towel bench from football? That's like when you, yep. when you don't want to. soccer. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Are you even American? <laughs> Woo! I didn't play football either. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> when I was in school in the South, one of the most like pertinent questions, the deep philosophical relevance that you could ask someone was, mm -hmm. hey man, where'd you play your high school football at? I'm, like, I'm sorry, what? I didn't. But, and you never want to say that. You just make some shit up. <laughs> the accent was so good. I just went, just went straight to college, bro. <laughs> like, wow. My favorite thing is like old white dudes that see me. It's always, always. <laughs> on a, I'm not, I haven't gone a week without missing it. Some old white guy's like, you should play on my football team, young man. I'm like, what the fuck? I didn't even play. <laughs> it's just yeah. Like, it's hold so up, funny. Pause. <laughs> okay. And see, I'm, I'm with you 99%. <laughs> Listen, if they say that recently, can you imagine you on like a Pop Warner team? You're like, I'm sorry, I've never played football. Like, anyway, you see that white kid right there that weighs 57 pounds? Just just run and pretend he's not there. <laughs> just go. He's going to Mr. Potato Head out of the way, and oh. you'll be the fucking man. 
<laughs> God damn. Yeah. Uh, what was the original question? Uh, bench. Like, yes. You, yes. You know. Okay. So everyone's different mm -hmm. and you do a certain exercise and it's going to give you some proxies of how stimulative it is. For example, do you feel the tension of the target muscle? Some mm -hmm. people are like, I bench and I feel it in my shoulders, not my pecs. That's a fucking problem. So uh, do you get a burn with higher reps mm -hmm. or do you get the profound tension with lower reps? Does that exercise for the number of sets you have to do it give you a good pump? Then you get on a machine press and you're like, I've done 10 sets and nothing's fucking happening to my yeah. body. You do a set of bench and you're like, holy fucking shit. Is the muscle significantly weak afterwards? Is it perturbed? Does it get sore? If someone could do a set of bench and their like, shoulders get sore and their elbows get sore and you're like, pecs? They're like, nope, I got nothing. Someone else could do bench press and it lights up their pecs and everything else is great. Mm -hmm. So those proxies and then those are on the top, that's stimulus. And then we do a little equation, we do a divide and we do fatigue on the bottom, right? How much fatigue? How much is it beating up your joints? How much like psychological effort does it take you? So for example, if you can get on a machine press and just like calmly knock out sets of 10 and you get super fucking pumped and sore, yeah. getting a fucking arch and retraction and fucking nose torque and up, 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 and you fucking do all that shit and uh -huh. you feel like totally drained and they're like, how are your pecs? You're like, I don't know, I can't fucking tell. Mm -hmm. Then that's a lot of fatigue for not a whole lot of stimulus. So if you can maximize the stimulus, minimize the fatigue, some exercises for any one person will do that better than others. And usually we all have like a top five or 10 exercises that are in the running for that best stimulus to fatigue ratio. Yeah. They're not always going to be the same because you encounter stainless. I mean, you can bench for six months straight and someone's like benching, like I'm fucking done benching for a while. Mm -hmm. My elbows are starting to feel weird. My pecs aren't responding anymore. You switch to dumbbells or machine and now it's fresh and now it feels good. Mm. So you rotate through that top five or 10 best SFR stimulus to fatigue ratio exercises. And that's where, that's where you go for, for your really good training. Someone might rank the bench press 15 out of the running. They basically never do it. Mm -hmm. Someone might rank dumbbell press number one mm -hmm. on average mm -hmm. and everything in between. And for, as your body changes and you get more jacked, et cetera, that shifts and some lifts come up and some lifts come down. So if you can just relatively objectively and at least honestly tell yourself, okay, I know I love the bench press, but is no longer working for me, at least for the time now, <clears throat> as well as let's say something else, dumbbell press for a while, just do some dumbbell presses until maybe the bench press feels less stale. Try yeah. it again. See if you can alter your technique to feel it more. And if it goes great, if not, you have tons of other exercises to choose from. I'm a huge, huge, it's the opposite of fan hater, right? You have fans and haters. Mm -hmm. Enemy is too personal. I was going to use enemy, but that's, that's a bit much. I'm a big hater on people who are always looking for the one optimal exercise. Yeah. It's like in jujitsu, looking for the one uh, optimal sweep. Like, yeah, what if he gets wise to that, shuts your dumb ass down? What you going to do? You're like, I don't know anything else. Like, you're an idiot. Yeah. You should have had the top two or three, right? So I, I'm not a big fan of people being like, what's better, hack squat or leg press? Well, Try both. See which one gives you more stimulus. Like if your quads are super pumped and your knees feel great on the leg press, but not the hack squat, you just got your answer. And then do leg pressing for a while until you maybe get tired of it. And then try hack squatting, but really try to use a good technique that maximizes stimulus, reduces the fatigue, and then go from there. And so you can have a few exercises in your rotation all the time that are your mm -hmm. best heavy hitters. Use them. You don't necessarily have to say, well, it's ball, barbell compounds for me and it's all machines. It's always going to be a mix. And you're a big fan of uh, full range of motion, but you've also mentioned that <clears throat> You also like to use context, and it doesn't mean that you sure. do full range and full range of motion on everything all the time. Um, but a lot of the a lot of your workouts, that's something that you're emphasizing. What about kind of like the difference between like a full range motion range of motion in something like a hack squat versus doing like a partial range of motion in a hack squat, where you're like literally just kind of chasing the pump because you can get like a certain amount of tension on the muscle uh, in a well, at least I can on some movements with a shorter range of motion. So kind of what are your thoughts there? Like yeah. uh, this constant muscle tension. Some people argue like I'd rather have constant muscle tension than to go full range. I would ask them what the point of constant muscle tension is. Why is that better? Maybe somebody would say just to like, just to get a pump more, uh, maybe more effectively or faster. One thing that I argue against sometimes is my own background, which is powerlifting. <laughs> sure. You know, deadlifting, squatting, bench fucking, pressing. Fucking trader. Yeah, I know. All those movements are amazing, but they all take a lot of time. Sure. You know, they, they like I might do 10, especially when I was stronger, I might do like, I don't know, eight or 10 sets. And then just being older and it taking more time for me to warm up. I'm like, that's an hour long process of like yes. getting to that bench press when sure. I could really just, uh, you know, hop on a machine and, and get a, a really good pump. Sure. and kind of find a rep, a repetition range of motion 
that just floods the area with with tons of blood. Sure. I, I know there's like two different objectives. No, no, that's there, okay. But. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that if your range of motion that you've chosen is the one that gives you the best pump by like an obvious long shot, I would be remiss to tell you it's not going to work. I would say I think that's really great. What I would do, though, is I would come to the gym with you and try to get you to do super range of motion, hack squats, et cetera, mm. and see if you didn't get an even better pump. Mm. Uh, so Jared Feather and I, he's one of my colleagues at RP. I love Jared. Sounds like I a fake pro. name. I love it's, Jared It's Feather. absolutely a fake name. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's Jared Feather. I mean, it's just Bro, a, pull Jared Feather up, man. I've seen him, but it's His just, physique. Yeah. He's, He's like, so oh, easy. Bubbly. I've got a hot key for that one. <laughs> Jared shit. A locator to tell him where he is at all times. So um, Jared Feather and I have a pretty decent record of introducing lifters to range of motion and even more range of motion than they thought. Making them cry. And it was almost mm -hmm. never, maybe never, were they like, yeah, man, like, I know, the fucking shorter arm worked better for me, better pump. Jesus. Usually they're like, holy fucking shit, what is the point of this? Jesus. Oh, yeah, this is him recently. Dog. I think this is what all of you us feel like we're going to grow up to be. Say it well, again? it's a part of the sport, Mark. Oh. What are we supposed to wear? Oh, oh you know. oh, you wanted nudity. No, I just, I want to be What's with all this underwear business? No, I just want to be able to issue guys like underwear that I personally purchase. Mm. It's a thing. It's a weird, I know. I can it's give strange. you old underwear of mine that's, mm -hmm. we'll say you've been through a lot. Okay. Oh, that's good. A lot of squat workouts. That's a good You stuff. could say squat workouts if you like to keep it vanilla. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot of chocolate though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat it. You could eat it. But. Why is this guy so jacked? Full range of motion? So Jared Feather is God's gift to bodybuilding genetics. He was a student of mine. That's how I met. And he was sitting in the front row and I looked down at him. I was like, ah, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Look at them delts. <laughs> Cap to shit. And so he's amazing genetics. He's brilliant. He's the best student I've ever had as a professor. He's, I don't know if he's ever missed a single question or point. You're a professor? Mm -hmm. mm. He's yeah, a like, professor. He's the natty professor. I'm the natty professor. That's what's up. Uh, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> uh, that's actually how I you look got great. That's the, <laughs> black people really don't age, I guess. They don't, brother. They don't. You know all that shit about like. Um, uh, oh, some really of them can't that's play basketball though. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Shut yeah. up, bro. I had that. Um, <laughs> it's a bit windy in here. And the Jada, sun is in his eyes. <laughs> There's a lot of sun. Yeah. Jada Pinkett Smith. What about her? Yeah, um, you're not supposed to talk about her. The alopecia? Is she gonna cancel me? <laughs> Whoa, bro. <laughs> you don't know what it is, don't you? She has a beautiful head. I don't know why she's Yo, tripping. so for real, she's all like pissed. I'm like, you are. Fine. She's hot. Like, Pink <laughs> Smith make, is un, makes me uncomfortable. The first time I ever discovered her in the early 90s, I was like, how does yeah, this such a yeah, perfect yeah. human being exist? Mm. And she's still flawless, girl. Yeah. If you're out there, I'm married, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you get that time machine <laughs> popping. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Will, Will Smith, um, you probably please don't hit me in the face. Yeah, I love your work. I, I told myself after the whole slapping incident that yeah. I would never watch Will Smith shit ever again. Mm. And then I was on a plane like a couple days ago to, to come to Northern California to hang out with you guys. Mm -hmm. And I was like scrolling through and like, yeah, I was on a decent amount of THC. Yeah. So I can't be responsible for what happened next, but I absolutely watched a Will Smith movie. And of course I fucking cried because he's fucking seven amazing. pounds or pursuit of happiness. I do, I do, so I don't get into that like real deep, like Will Smith crying face movie type oh, okay, shit. Okay, I usually okay. stay with like the comedy action, uh, bad boys. That him yeah, crying kind of, though. Like when his dog dies, so that one's pretty good bad. at yep. it. And you can see mm. all the emotions face. But in any case, Mr. Will Smith, <laughs> I said I wouldn't watch the movies, but I did. I just, I found his apology pretty convincing, and I just love the guy. He can do no wrong in my eyes. I mean, what like, if he trained with Joel Seedman? <laughs> 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 when I said no wrong, I mean almost no wrong. Yeah. If he, if I was on a comedy stage and I knew for a fact that Will Smith had trained with Joel Seedman, I would say some nasty shit. I'd be like, "Hey, Will Smith, guess what? You, you are." Bitch. <laughs> All right, let me let me ask this real quick. But then, okay, hold on. <laughs> okay, actually, go ahead. Go ahead. As he came up to the stage, <laughs> I would already have a very well practiced jujitsu setup. Mm, like there we fucking, go. Oh, like a jujitsu chop yeah. to the throat, collar drag, <laughs> deep half, back take, it just oh. toothpaste style. Shit and he's wearing up. a suit, so it would work perfectly. But actually, when I took his back, yeah, I instantly realized what I was doing. It. I'd get off and be like, I can't hurt you, Mr. Smith. You're my favorite actor. Oh God. <laughs> I would cry. So you wouldn't make him shit his pants? No, but it would be like he knew I could have kind of shit. Yeah, that's fair. But if he was trained by Joel Seedman, you just have to go past 90 and he wouldn't be able to well, full slap, I right? I would like, slap him <laughs> down, but he wouldn't fall. He's like, I've been unstable my whole life thanks to Joel Seedman. I'm never stable. I'm like, oh shit. And then he slaps me and I cry. Um, and then he does the whole get your wife's name out of my mouth where he's crying, but 
Do you guys remember that? That was the weirdest part of that whole thing. We was clearly like close to tears. It was like, emotional. That, that doesn't sound like a tough guy thing. He's like, <laughs> I think she, I like, think she put a curse on him, bro. It was mm-hmm. tough. So too. You, oh, is, is that the candidate hypothesis of the I day? Think she put a curse. Got on emotional. Him. I wouldn't. Yeah. I usually I'd be like, what? But I'm feeling that because there's nothing else to explain that shit. Because he looked over at her and she was like. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, here we go again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the chef at a cruise ship last week. And now it's Chris Rock. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, man. How many non-famous people do you think he slapped for shit like that? Oh, oh there, was, there, there was like, um, there was a video of him, like a really? reporter came in for a kiss, like 10 I or 12 see, years yes. ago. And he, like, he, it, if a guy comes in for a kiss, like, and he's really coming out, he's just like, oh, it was just a little, you know, a little slap. Get out of my face. Yeah. Hmm. But what would knows? you have done if a man was, was you're quick. Let's be honest. You're quite good looking. If a man came in for a mm-hmm. kiss, I just I wouldn't hit him. I right? Just, you just, just be like, "Sir, yeah, that's what know, the stiff arm yeah, is for." What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't need to hit him. Plus, like, if he's <clears throat> b- number one, I think I'd actually run because if he's bold enough to look at me and then try to come up and just kiss me, what if he's from like another you know country? Like sometimes problem. they do that. Mm-hmm. Like he's, like yeah, he's Italian or something. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he just wants to give you some love. So if it was one of those, I think it was though, right? What was he trying to do? Was trying to kiss him on the mouth? It looked like it looked like a mouth kiss, like a like a Lil Wayne and Birdman type of kiss. Do you guys remember that? They no. straight up kiss in the mouth. Can you please pull that up? I'm looking for it. You said I don't want to even monopolize your show, but <laughs> oh, there God. are pictures of that shit. I mean, mm. it's, hey, listen, these it's Atlanta 2022. rappers, man. It's 2022. They're not yeah. even from Atlanta. How dare you? But Atlanta rappers have a tendency. Apparently. No way. What? Apparently, is there a video yeah, of this? Uh, ATL rappers they, of like they do some weird stuff. Hey, I'm, I'm next plane booked to Atlanta. <laughs> to Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why not? Okay. We had to come back to the semen thing. Yes, yes. I don't even know where we were. Will Smith. It doesn't but, matter. Wait a second. <laughs> Hold on. I didn't know about this. Will Smith squatting above Parallel. Oh, oh yeah. Is that I it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember oh, this. Oh, I remember this. This was a I long time it. ago. There, yeah. That guy back there is like, oh, oh, shit, I'm in this picture. Ooh. Yeah. This is real sus. Honestly, huh. that much talent? Maybe there's a miscommunication. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> they're just really trying to hear each other, and they, yeah. they, they have to do it like I, I think it's great. Yeah. Got, oh, yeah, yeah. He's trying to whisper. I got everything. That's all right answers to me, as far as I can tell. There we go. That's yeah, 2022. Okay. One thing that you've continued <laughs> to mention. It wasn't back then. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> thank God it is now. Mark's like, what the fuck is going on in my show? I love it. <laughs> okay. It's <laughs> a terrible mistake to bring me on. No, I love it. Um, but one thing that you've continued to mention that I think is something that people should pay attention to is if you continue to like sometimes bring it back to if the athlete feels this if the individual feels this working now you'll have individuals out there who are like uh, biomechanics blah blah and they're like it doesn't matter how it feels mm. Biome- this isn't a biomechanically efficient movement to target this this or this um and i'm just curious what how much legitimacy do you believe that has especially when it comes to bodybuilding because like mm. there are a lot of movements that people are like wow this feels amazing this i feel a lot of progress at this movement mm-hmm. i feel the muscle mm-hmm. But biomechanically, it's not efficient. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So the charitable answer, if I'm being completely open-minded, is I I would give some credence to that because you can misinterpret cues. Mm -hmm. You can think it's one muscle, but it's really another. Mm, Um, And sometimes when people say, I feel it, they don't even know what they're saying. Especially a newer lifter. Oh my God, for sure. Newer lifters or people that aren't, you know, so intelligent, but have been doing a long time. Look, I feel this like, shut the fuck up. They don't know what you feel. (laughs) But... um, it can absolutely be taken too far or if you have someone be like, look, this variation torches my biceps because I'm getting a pump because my biceps fucking hurt when I do this. Mm-hmm. When I do this other variation that's biomechanically optimal, I don't feel as much. You have to understand that that person is bringing you a little bit more insight than biomechanics can in this context. Because when we say biomechanics, what do we mean? We mean what's, what's actually called so, uh, diagrammatical bi- biomechanics where you draw a diagram, perhaps not so well, perhaps in absence of some of the physics that you claim to know. And then you draw a little stick figure diagram and you're like, ah, it should work like this. And in reality, there is not even yet a holistic computer modeling software for all of biomechanics. You would think it'd be a solved problem, right? Cars can fucking drive by themselves, but we can't, we don't have a biomechanics software that has integrated every single muscle and joint and tendon and connective tissue and let you play with lengthening and shortening the bones. Mm -hmm and get a 100% rendering of how it would work in real life. It can get pretty close nowadays, but those guys that talk about biomechanics they didn't use that software. And as soon as you use that software, you realize that small changes in position, small changes in anthropometry, how long someone's femurs are, et cetera, can cause really large changes in perceptively what kind of technique would work ideally for them. 
And biomechanics doesn't even take into account muscle fibers. Almost all biomechanics done by people who are in the in the muscle and fitness realm, they um, essentially assume that the muscle is like a single is like a single string variable, like pushing uh, like a pulling e equation. That's it. Like if it was just one string tied to one place and another in one servo motor, that's as complicated as they would make the muscle. But muscles have shape. And when muscles move over other joints, they change shape and change lever arm. And that makes things really complicated. So you say, well, ideally you should do this, but apparently when he does this, he says it feels it more because your biomechanical analysis did not integrate the fact that their pecs have to slip over the rib cage mm -hmm. and that changes a bunch of angles. So the real world is fucking complicated. And what is the ultimate insight from the real world from top down is someone's like, dude, this fucking lights my pecs up. You go, okay, whatever assumptions I made about my mechanics must be partially wrong because the biomechanics good exercise is not lighting up their packs like the real fucking thing they're showing me. So one of two things, they're either fucking idiots and they're wrong and the muscle doesn't mean anything, which is bullshit. They might be idiots. Or my biomechanics analysis did not integrate every variable that it could and does not sufficiently explain the complexity of the system. Now, the thing is, anyone who actually knows biomechanics will tell you this is all uh, inference and heuristics. This is like somewhere to get you to thinking a little bit more clearly about the problem. Biomechanics does not open and shut answer every single problem. You know, like there's no way to read a biomechanics book and be like, I know how to do every exercise perfectly. That's not a thing. You may be able to rule out some real dumb shit or rule out some, or rule in some real smart shit. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, the, that's a good part of the equation. Okay. Biomechanically, my shit needs to be at least remotely sound. Like if you're training your triceps, but there's no extension at the elbow, <laughs> someone could be like, <laughs> Well, isn't the primary function of a tricep to do this? You're like, yeah, but don't worry about it. Like then you fucked up your biomechanics. But outside of that, you have to use biomechanics as well as the feel of the muscle, the joint, et cetera, as well as how that reflects your numbers progression over the months. Like you start doing this tricep exercise, the biomechanics said it's probably going to work. Probably not for sure. It's not the best ever. Maybe yeah. it's a, a tool. The exercise is amazing on your joints. It gives you gnarly fucking pumps, super crazy tricep tension. And then over the course of several weeks to several months, you've just been adding weight to those tricep exercises. And all of a sudden your girlfriend's like, oh my God, honey, your triceps are like so bad. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, you fucking like them. And she's like, oh my God. And then you know that you're really fucking probably things are working. Yeah. But just biomechanics by itself is the beginning of a guess. It is not the total answer. Mm -hmm. And if you tell someone, hey, like what you're feeling doesn't matter. What you should be telling him is, hey, what you're feeling matters in the context of other shit going on. Like if you have a dispute, like three or four other people, and someone's crying, and like they're apparently in the wrong, at least talk to them, see why they're crying. Yeah. Now, they may still be a scumbag who started the whole thing, but now they're crying. They could still be wrong, but I will at least hear from them. So if someone's like, well, it doesn't matter what your muscles are feeling, like, mm, let's see. Let's see. And if someone's like, I feel the muscle better this way, but biomechanically they're doing the movement super fucking wrong, you're like, I feel that maybe you're getting a good result this way. Let me, let me work with you a little bit and get you to change the movement pattern. And all of a sudden, if you're correct about your biomechanical assumptions, they'll be like, holy fuck, JK, this is even mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. But if they're like, ah, this feels like shit, you could tell them, hey, listen, if you practice this new way, you might get a better mind-muscle connection. It'll work out. But after a couple of weeks of due diligence, they're like, nah, man, my old method was just fucking better on my joints and it hit my muscles. You just have to step away as an intelligent person who knows some biomechanics and say, okay, whatever assumption matrix I have designed for biomechanics that did not map exactly onto the rea onto reality. And that's okay. It was an educated guess. And sometimes those are wrong, but if the people are really feeling a certain exercise a certain way and they can make progress with it, you have to respect that complex system as giving you an answer that is not something you calculated. Mm. And then it, it's probably correct. Uh, I would bet more on it than I would bet on just biomechanics alone, but you don't have to because you can use fucking both. Fat Project family, how's it going now? We like to look good in the gym and out of the gym. Uh, that's why you always see Mark and I and Andrew is stepping up on the short, short game, mm -hmm. wearing shorts from Viore and clothes from Viore. And honestly, the number one compliment that I've seen that I've gotten and even Mark's gotten is, damn, your butt looks good. <laughs> and that's because, well, the clothes we wear make our booties look mm -hmm. delicious. Andrew, how can they get it? <laughs> yeah, you guys both have pretty big wagons. Uh, you guys can head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I.com slash power project to receive 20% off the most amazing apparel that looks so good inside and outside. It's going to make your ass look Fat and, and your people ass like will that. look fat. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Make your ass look fat. <laughs> 
how do you actually train? Like, do you um... mindless bro <laughs> shit? Dude, I mostly just hit my head against. That's why my fucking skin is so big. <laughs> like uh, for myself, I like to like overload with a particular movement. Um, not all the time, but quite frequently, overload on a particular movement. And then the rest of the workout is uh, just kind of chasing after the pump. That's like really powerlifting type shit. That's like yeah. the ghosts of powerlifting. Mm -hmm. um, every single exercise I do is designed to continue to target that muscle to stimulate it. And so every single exercise is to present um, sufficient tension for sufficient reps to give gnarly pump and burn, et cetera. So I approach all of my exercises probably somewhere between where you approach them. You have like an overloading exercise where you go super fucking hard, super serious. And then you have like the eh, mm -hmm. scroll the phone, uh, get out. My shit's probably somewhere between the two where I'm like very focused, calm. And I hit a certain rep goal. And then next week I beat it by a rep or I add five pounds. And then towards the last weeks of my accumulation, you know, week five or something before deload, it's like life and death, me trying to get the reps, but always with good technique. Mm. So I would say that's kind of where I fall on that. And are you just, is it like quite simply just trying to send some sort of signal to your body, whether it's, you know, the, the weights, uh, you know, if the weights are heavier, like obviously when the weights are heavier, the reps are going to be a little bit less. And as you progress through the workout, potentially, uh, maybe you're going higher reps because you're just accounting for some fatigue, that kind of thing. Sure. So I, I generally tend to pick my exercises and rep ranges at the same time. So for example, if I do squats for quads, I'll do sets of five to 10. Why? Because if you do sets of 12 to 15, my lower back fatigue limits my quads and they don't actually get a good stimulus. It's a great exercise. I just start throwing up a lot. It's a great exercise to overload. Like I've pointed this out when I used to do some CrossFit powerlifting seminars, I would ask people, you know, what's the most amount of weight somebody lifted in the room and someone was, you know, 300, 400, 500, there'd still be some hands up. And uh, normally it was in a deadlift or in a squat. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, those are good exercises. An overhead squat, while it's a great movement, maybe that's not the greatest exercise to- It's limited by your shoulders. Overload your yes. quads, right? Yes. So if it's something, if it's a movement in which I can go heavy, if it's a movement in which the target muscle is still the limiting factor when I go heavy, and if it's a movement that when I go heavy, I feel a shitload of tension in the muscle, it's safe for the joints. Because you're like, you know, one arm preacher bicep curl, you may not want to go super heavy because- I like that part right there, the yeah. safety factor. I think For sometimes sure. we're not always thinking about that part. <clears throat> yeah, that's all I think about. I'm Jewish, man. I'm just anxious all the time. Oh, I could get height. Oh, oh God. No. <laughs> Jews aren't allowed to make fun of themselves anymore? <laughs> no. Are we always that 2022? It's just a good one, man. Oh, I, just, just perma I was born injured, you know? It's an <laughs> undiagnosed injury. They're like, ah, you're just Jewish. Pause real quick. Uh, you speak Russian. Are you also Russian? Yeah. yeah. You are Russian. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like, you know, prior to this Ukraine thing, I was. Mm. Oh, yeah. Now you're, now you're Ukrainian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, think, uh, I think my mom started telling people we were from generally Eastern Europe, unless they ask. Yeah. I actually haven't made any public statements. Can I make a statement about the Russia-Ukraine yes, situation? Yes, yeah. um, The sooner Putin dies, the better this world will be. I can't fucking wait for that asshole mm. to die. I'm in America for a reason, because Russia blew ass, and now it blows even more ass. Uh, Ukraine has a right to self-determination, and it seems like a generally better place than Russia. And if you invade a place and you start fucking losing that war... Don't bitch about it. Fuck you, Putin. There's my view. Mm, there you go. Uh, yeah. I want to real quick go back to uh, biomechanics again. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you kept seeing uh, if the muscle's tired, fatigued, and sore. This motherfucker's taking notes on shit. Yeah, so. no, I, I am. Yeah, why are you notes flexing? The whole time, too. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so again, one of those things is like, uh, with biomechanics, like it taught me, <laughs> Mark's touching. Me too. Me too. Mark's, or Mark, geez, biomechanics taught me like how to like really flex into like my lats and stuff because mm -hmm. I'm taking all these different factors of my like anatomy and everything and, you know, the physics of resistance mm -hmm. all into account. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I didn't even know I had a, a rear delt, you know, now that I know yeah, how yeah. to fucking, you know, sure. do shit. Um, and then again with like sissy squats, you know, like, holy shit, dude, my quads are on fire. Yeah. They have been on fire during regular squats too. Yes. But one of those things is a lot less weight and the other one's a lot more weight. Sure. It's a compound movement. So you can stay being a little weak bitch, but have big quads. Yes. So <laughs> is there a problem with like, get, because the, from what I understand, muscles don't really necessarily understand what's going on. They just are told like, oh, we got to move, you know, this shin bone this way. Yes. So it doesn't know that like, oh, you have two plates on your back versus you're just, you weigh 180 pounds and you're doing a bitch ass sissy squat, right? right. <laughs> which I love by Alone the way. In they're, the they're, my, they're my favorite. Mm -hmm. I fucking love them. Mm -hmm. Is there an issue with like not moving that much weight? Like if the yeah, muscles yeah. are still tired, fatigued yeah. and sore, like 
is there a problem there? Good, good question. So mm -hmm. two answer, two part answer to that. One is you make a very excellent point that like the sensation, the feeling part, actually corroborates the biomechanical part. Like if Doug Brignoli says, "Hey, do sissy squats like this, and I promise your quads will get torched." If you did sissy squats like you said, and your quads didn't feel shit, you'd be like, "The fuck up out of here, bro!" Mm -hmm. But it actually does torture your quads. So you're like, "Ah, we have the biomechanic side, and we have the experience side. If they align, you know you're onto some shit. You know you're on the right stuff." But as far as if you're missing anything, so generally speaking, uh, body systems that are unstable fail to generate their maximum amount of force that they can. So if you try to squat on standing on ice. That'd be a kind of a cool, like, Lion King on ice, like, powerlifting on ice. <gasps> um, bigger, faster, stronger on ice. <laughs> Someone on TikTok actually <laughs> did a rough. squat on a thing of, like, a, a big thing of ice somewhere Ooh. in Alaska. It was that's, some, that's some TikTok shit. Yeah. yeah. That's the kind of shit, like, the ice breaks and you fucking die, but it's on TikTok, <laughs> so it was worth it. That'd be tough. It like, went viral. This is, like, the, the, the least sad headline you could hear is, TikTok influencer dies, you're, like, maxed scroll. <laughs> oh, Amazing. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding, right? I'm kidding. You can't put kidding? too much force into it, otherwise you'll break the ice. <laughs> exactly. It was too strong for that ice, bro. That's oh, why I'm dead. Um, so if you try to squat on ice, <laughs> then your body will detect that you're unstable. And parts of your quads um, that your brain activates, it's like the nerve and the muscles, that, uh, parts of your muscles that it uh, innervates, that it connects to. It's called a motor unit. It won't activate the biggest, gnarliest, strongest motor units, the ones that grow the most when you train them. It'll activate a bunch of them, but not all the super tip top, super growth responsive ones because they get saved only for when you're really close to failure with a weight is super fucking heavy. And when you're stable enough to really just fucking push like crazy. So sissy squats can get you an absolutely great quad workout, but they'll probably leave some of your quads underdeveloped because having a full heel and toe on the platform, hack squat, leg press, Smith machine squat, regular squat, will probably get you to access and tap into and stimulate those super biggest, fastest motor units that get you the most growth just a little bit better than sissy squats. So if you're um, training to just be regular jacks, you don't want to be some kind of freak or some shit like that. If you're in a rush, if you've had enough of this bullshit your whole life, your spine is in fucking powder and you're like, fuck that, then sissy squats are amazing. But if I had someone come up to me and say, can I get maximum quad development doing sissy squats? A, 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 even better example. Someone said, listen, I'm like taking second and third at nationals and they say my quads are too small just by a bit. But I like sissy squats. I'd be like, uh-huh, uh, -huh. uh -huh. Have you met Mr. Regular Stable Squat or Leg Press or Hack Squat? And they're like, yeah, I don't know. Fuck that. Shit is hard. <laughs> and then it'd be like, you have to do that shit. So, so yes, largely it works, but I think there is something a little bit missing, which is totally fine. Is we're, all, we're not all trying to do the optimal thing all the fucking time. And there is no one exercise that's optimal anyway. But yes, uh, CC squats are missing something because your quads don't know what's going on, but their ability to produce force is smaller in an unstable environment. And CC squats are by definition less stable because you're on your fucking tippy toes doing this shit. Mm -hmm. I'm not that athletic, so as soon as I get on my tippy toes, I start to fall. There's another Jewish joke there somewhere. <laughs> that, that was extremely well said. Um, yeah, because like when, when I am doing, so I do them on a slant board. Um, so I am, you know, fairly stable, but I am more on my toes. But that's like kind of like a squat. So is so your I, heel cable, is your heel on the slant board? Yes. Yeah, so it's a, and I'm holding a cable. Mm -hmm. So it's a cable sissy squat, technically, if we want to put a sure, of course. term on right it. Out of, right out of Doug's book. Yes, exactly. That's where I learned it from. There you go. Like personally, like he was here and he showed me. But um, what else did he show you when he was here? Um, he did change in front of me. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Dude, he's Ooh. fucking jacked. I don't know how old he is, but he's fucking jacked. I don't jacked. care how old he is. Some of those old guys. <laughs> some of those old guys, they wear a jock strap. Um, I found that. Uh, that's, what you used to, yeah, that's what you used to use. I found that in power that's what athletes did. for some reason. I'm like, why is that guy wearing a uh, jock strap? So, so real talk, this is this is how out of the loop I am. <laughs> Anytime there was like- What does that have for? Movies. Like they were like, yeah, jock strap. They made that joke. I'm like- what the fuck is a jock strap? Mm -hmm. It's like a place where your your dick hides or something. <laughs> I guess so. What the fuck happened to underwear? But, what is a jock strap doing to you? That pause. Actually, but what also, is a jock strap now? But like, see, also, none of us like, knew. Only Mark knows because he's like fucking hundred. But it's like it's like assless though. Why was it always that? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are we really going to debate that? <laughs> Clearly, the merits are there. <laughs> Just turn around. Well, a jock strap oh, would normally what? hold like a cup, but like I've yeah. seen like old powerlifting guys, they change, and I'm like, why are they wearing a jock <laughs> like strap? Like for? In Seema looked up the jock strap to try to learn shit. I think he lo knows less now than he did. And he's so excited. <laughs> I just don't get right? why you're why anybody is to, wearing to, this because it's got a little pocket for a it's cup. Hot. 
I know, but then oh, like, yeah. it's hot. like your ass cheeks are out. See, that's like, what I mean. I never understood that part of it. <laughs> that's like, yeah, like, yeah. That's when you're like, I'm into sports. Like, oh, sports, that's fun. Like, you guys get to wear that stuff. You're like, that's not why I'm in sports. <laughs> and it's like, and in, in, in baseball, like where it's like you're always fucking around. Like it was always the most prevalent there. My, it's just like dudes walking around in fucking jock bro, My ideal place on this. But earth. why aren't you wearing regular underwear too? Like, that's what it, I mean. I don't so un- get it. Like. It kills to wear that Wait, thing. If you get your ass to hang out and it looks like a little bit sort of S and M look, why would you want to wear a regular uh, underwear? My ideal place on this earth is in a man's locker room, just just being there. You know, just the smells, the sights. Uh, and without jock straps, it would be like a fucking boring as shit. It's like going to a business meeting. If I'm not seeing ass cheek, I'm out. That's true. Mm. That's true. Bye. No ass cheeks. No fun. Business meetings with ass cheek with ass cheeks? Well, business meetings are boring. I'm saying this, oh, this is there's oh. business and there's fun. If, no. if there's no ass cheeks, then I'm at a fucking business. I, I might as well be at a business. So meeting. maybe we have a business meeting and we wear jock straps. No, no one's getting anything done at that point. <laughs> but I, I, I want to quickly add in about the sissy squat that Andrew's mentioning. The sissy squat's an interesting movement because it's a movement that not for many, sissies yeah, must for be acknowledged. Sissies, not many people do it, but when you start to do it, it's a movement that if you do it consistently, you'll progress pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Like like you'll reach, you'll for a lot of people who've come from a background of maybe doing squats and a lot of bigger movements, you'll be able to do the stack fairly soon, you know? And it's like, where's the progress from there? If you're sufficiently strong, sissy squats will no longer be a viable option for you. My grip mm. would go before anything else would happen or yeah. I would just cantilever forward and fall. Yeah. But something like a properly positioned hack squat still lets you push through the heels and the toes and at gee whiz angle wise, the bottom part, your degree of knee flexion is basically the same as it is in sissy squat. Yeah. But it's more stable. Uh, I'm telling you, they knew what they were doing when they invented the hack squat. What they, about the torturous uh, thing hack. of the, the sissy squat where you, Hackenschmidt. John oh, Hackenschmidt. Oh, that, that was his real name. Yeah. Um, you, what about the torturous thing of the, the the sissy squat where you put your feet in those things and you squat down? That What's that one? Put you know your feet in those things. Oh, yeah, you put your feet uh, in that like a uh, little stable metal thing. Oh, that like has an like, actual sissy oh, squat. Oh, yes. Like those are cool. Whatever. That'll those fuck your world suck. up. I Try doing that with a 45 pound those. plate. You're going to cry. Honestly, those are the shit. I have one made by Arsenal Strength in those my little devastating. RP gym that we have. And they'll they'll fuck you right into your ass. <laughs> <laughs> they will. Which if you have a jock strap on, <laughs> you're, you're already halfway yeah. there. <laughs> which is really, I think, why the jock strap exists. Oh. Yeah. I'm not yeah, trying to take your underwear go. off in the locker room. <laughs> Other guys will see us. <laughs> <laughs> You're starting to make a good point. Other guys. Mm. I'm going to get a job. There it is. This fucking did we, thing. Did a viral video go around a while ago about Man, some guy so. doing something? And he fucked on himself this. up. Yes. Yeah, and his knee just went. Oh, oh, oh you I remember that? Oh, no, I don't want to remember yeah, that. Yeah, that no. shit was Those uh, injury videos, man, honestly, like I'm good with like blood and shit, but mm. if I see one, especially when you like to hear the snap. Mm-mm-mm. Or like the uh, the the skinnier person on like a leg press and they like flamingo their feet that their knees the wrong way. Yeah, no thanks. I get a lot of shit for that because myself, Jared, Charlie, and all of us at Team Full Rom, we uh we do full lockouts when the <sighs> when it feels fine. Mm-hmm. And every time we do it, there's eighteen fucking trillion fifteen year olds like you don't want to do that, bro. My favorite is like <laughs> they're like trust me, bro. I'm like trust you, motherfucker. You don't even have an Instagram profile picture. Yeah. Who am I trusting? Well, there we go. Zero followers, zero likes, zero posts. I'm gonna trust you. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Uh, I'm curious about this, man. Um, we had Brad Schoenfeld on, and he came on and talked about. He was uh, here, here. Or oh no, he, he, we had him on Zoom. We had him on Zoom, um, and we started talking about aspects of like the mind muscle connection. And then mm-hmm. uh, I asked him something, but he mentioned how, it, as an individual gets more experience in training and they get better mind muscle connection over time, they might actually be able to get away with utilizing lesser volumes while still being able to make progress because their mind muscle connection is better. I wanted to ask, how does that work? Because I've noticed that for myself, like with the, like I can do lighter loads, the lot of movements that I Mm -hmm. used to in the past do heavier Mm -hmm. loads with get sore, great stimulus, great progression. And I'm not having to work with this heavy of load. How does that work for people so they can understand? Because most people just want to just, keep working with heavier and heavier and heavier yeah. weight, but that might bite you in the ass at some point. Sure. I think there are two elements to it. One is by having a higher mind muscle connection and practicing that. So it's nothing like you get from the first time someone teaches you, you're like, I don't know, it feels like fucking the same. I'm actually weaker. Fuck this. Mm-hmm. You practice connecting with your muscle and all of a sudden you may be able to preferentially recruit that muscle to help that movement earlier. Because so for example, like if you're doing, let's say 
a skull crusher or something. Yeah. There's quite a bit of chest involvement, shoulder involvement, tricep involvement. And if you don't have a good mind-muscle connection, you can end up using a lot of chest and shoulder to propel the movement. And someone's like, hey, how are your triceps? Oh, yeah, they're good. Right? I felt something. Mm -hmm. But if you really feel it out, a lot of times the fraction of the total force produced by the movement that your triceps are doing is higher because you're activating them volitionally more yeah. than you would. And then you just get more high-quality work because they're on more of the time. Mm -hmm. The second way that happens is a good mind-muscle connection can subtly influence your technique so that you use better technique. So for example, if you're really connected to your pecs and you know when they're on, if you bench and your shoulder blades are out like this, you're like, yeah, okay, I can feel my pecs. But let's say one day you slightly let your scapulae drop back and now you get the stretch. You're like, holy shit. And you look it up and then after a while you're archering and tracking your power lifter and it destroys your fucking pecs every time. And someone would be like, well, do you know, like, is that biomechanically better? You're like, I don't fucking know. All I can tell you is when I do it this way, my pecs are on fire. And if you have no mind-muscle connection, that whole, like, I feel my pecs working properly, that's not yeah. even a thing you can say because someone could be like, how you're, you know, can you imagine, like, someone does a world record squat and they walk off the platform. You're like, how'd your quads feel? They're like, <laughs> what? I don't, what? I don't know. Yeah. I got the fucking squat. That's all I give a shit about. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you can actually feel the pecs working and better technique than mind-muscle connection is a really cool tool, so especially if you know the technique decently to start with, mm -hmm. having a mind-muscle connection can reinforce where that good technique groove is. It's like uh, if you're driving a race car or some shit, and yeah, you can see the road, but every time you get off the track a little, the bumper strip thing, it does that, you're like, oop, too far. Yeah. And that's what mind-muscle connection can help you do in training if you sort of know how to read the, read the sounds of the prairie or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of bodybuilding stuff, we were talking about how maybe some, some bodybuilders aren't the smartest maybe to, to follow all the way through on a lot of the different things that they do. But I always find it really can, interesting. Can yeah, easy? absolutely. I always find it interesting that uh, so many things seem to go back to bodybuilding. Somebody talks about a diet and they're like, oh, you can do this diet, you can do that diet, you can do a keto diet, or you can do if it fits your macros. But ultimately when people are trying to get in shape, it comes down to you got to kind of follow a bodybuilding style diet when sure. someone's trying to get like shredded. Um, and same thing with stuff in the gym. You know, somebody might say, oh, I like doing kettlebell I like doing full body. I like doing these things. But again, it kind of seems like if you're trying for hypertrophy and you're trying to be well built and you're trying to uh, maximize your time in doing that, then kettlebell snatches and some of these movements, while they might have a lot of utility, they might be great movements, they might kind of overload the whole body. You're hearing more people kind of get into full body workouts and things of that nature. But if you're trying to be jacked, I think a lot of times it starts to narrate the information back yeah. to bodybuilding. That's super well put. I completely agree. And I'll add something on if it's okay. Um, is that Absolutely. Okay? <laughs> no, next subject. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people are interested in having their physique look a certain way. Yeah. And they say a lot of things that are sometimes also true that they have as goals. Like I want to be more athletic, et cetera. I want to have fun. Uh, and sometimes they say things like that that are not true at all. And they actually just want a really nice body. So, you know, if you had some kind of magic pill that just gave you a shredded, let's, let's set a standard here, fellas, Brad Pitt and fight club, the ultimate physique to ever walk the earth. Flex Wheeler, never heard of him. Brad Pitt, 155 pounds, cigarette addict. Do you guys know that's the thing? Like the Brad Pitt fight club bodies, like I want to look like that. Like, yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> Heroin's a hell of a drug, <laughs> fellas. JK. Um, <laughs> if you could have a magic pill that just gave you an amazing body, uh, a lot of people would be like, yeah, the gym, <laughs> fuck that. Because that's really what they want. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lifting technique for them that helps them maximize how their body looks, a lot of the what they said about how strong they wanted to get or whatever turns out to be maybe not as true as they said before. They just really want to look good naked. Oh, there it is. So they really just want to look good naked. And how do you end up doing that? Who's the best, <laughs> awkward way to say it, who are the people that have made the most serious attempt to look a certain way naked in the world? Bodybuilders. Yeah. And so they're going to they're gonna know a lot of stuff because at the end of the day, you can say, well, I just do CrossFit or I just do kettlebells. But like, yeah, you kind of want to look fucking legit. Mm -hmm. And then whatever way you do CrossFit and kettlebells maybe can be modified or supplemented by some bodybuilding stuff, including some dieting from bodybuilding. Uh, and then you get to looking like you actually wanted to look. That's like, you know, RP, the whole company we have or whatever. That's one of our big philosophies is meeting people where they are and being honest with them. We're like, do you want to look better 
they're like, yes, like sweet. Here's a program and here's how to change it, et cetera. We're not trying to be like, you're going to have health and strength and don't worry about how you look. Like, no, I know you're worried about how you look, but we can help with that shit. Yeah. So I think and a lot of that stuff comes back with bodybuilding being effective because at the end of the day, people can say like, well, I'm just into kettlebells. I don't care about how I look. Please. Sure you do. And, and when you, it comes and you to look great, Mark. I just thank you. Say, yeah, I was <laughs> strange to just say on TV. <laughs> um, <laughs> cable. It, this is cable access television. When right? it comes to some like general <laughs> bodybuilding <laughs> principles, what do those look like? When we're talking about like, you know, how to hypertrophy a muscle. What's the rep and set sure. and exercise amount scheme ish? Sure. So basically, specificity is king, and you want to make sure that the exercises you're doing are for the muscles that you want to grow. Mm -hmm. You would think this is totally obvious, but people are like, fuck, just do sets of 20 in the squat and your whole body grows. Like, right, except for not your upper body. They're like, no, man, it grows too. You're like, word up. <laughs> not that much based on your squat, right? right? The fuck does that work? And then you look at Olympic weightlifters and they don't do bench press and you're like, yes, they have small pecs. No surprise. Mm -hmm. So first specificity, and then you have to get into overload of how do we challenge the muscles. Basically, you have to take muscles and, Load them something like a 5RM all the way to a 30RM. Seems to be the most effective loading range. You move through a decent range of motion. We'll say mostly full range of motion. And you do enough sets that it is a, a, ch a challenge. And then when you have done enough sets and you go home and you spend a couple of days recovering, when you are recovered again, you go back and you re-stimulate that way. And if you say, okay, I only do two or three sets for my back per session, maybe you can do your back every day or every other day. If you do eight to 10 sets, maybe it's twice a week or something. Stimulate with heavy loading close to failure for exercises that train the target muscle until it is a la tired, as the French say. I speak fluent French, by the way. Can you guys tell? Yeah. I know other French words like Paris. That's Paris. Je oh, that's what's up. Whatever that meant. Yeah. Well, my French isn't that good. Yeah. What well, was um, that? What did you say? Uh, don't worry about it. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't understand. I wouldn't because I don't speak it's French. It's quite a no Whoa. Good okay, man. Nigerian, good at well. everything person. There's always a yeah, Nigerian. Yeah, seriously. It's probably oh, my Frenchman, you know what I just said. Fucked up, man. If everything you think you're good at, there's always a Nigerian person that's good <laughs> at it, and he <laughs> plays, he's like an NFL O-line. Like, fuck this. <laughs> Until they realize I was just saying gibberish. Anyway, let's continue. <laughs> that was pure gibberish. Maybe, you, it, maybe you're so smart that you just made up the French language independently. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, I can derive linguistic principles on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> like if somebody had to do it, it'd be a Nigerian guy. They're anyway, drop that word. <laughs> right. So, uh, so in any case, you train close to failure because it challenges the musculature, and you train with multiple sets of five to thirty repetitions in exercises that seem to target your muscles well and leave your joints the fuck alone to the extent that you'd like them to be left alone. You do that in a session rest session paradigm when you hit the. Shit, you recover. How do you know if you're recovered? First of all, you probably shouldn't be sore anymore. And also you should be able to perform at or above standard. So if you typically hack squat, let's say 400 for sets of 10, and you're like, man, I don't know if my legs are recovered. Time to find out. Warm up, do a set of 10. If you're like, oh, fuck, that was no problem. You're recovered. Mm -hmm. At least as strong as you used to be, maybe a little stronger. But if you want to train legs, let's say you were training legs Monday, Thursday, you switch to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but you didn't switch anything else. You come in to train legs on Wednesday and you are weaker than you used to be. And the question is, how are you supposed to progressively overload if you are sequentially weaker every time you show up? The answer is either you did too much in that session mm -hmm. or you didn't give yourself enough time to rest, which also opens up like these bodybuilding principles open up a huge plethora of ways in which you could be successful by doing different things. Someone could say, well, I like to train my legs three times a week with four sets each time. And someone could say, well, I do six each, each time but I do it twice a week. There is no wrong answer there. And a lot of individual variation mapped over that says that there's tons of right answers. And so as long as the principles are not violated, the super general ones, like, are you recovered before you train? Yeah. Are you stimulating the muscle effectively? If you're doing those things, the way in which they get done could be quite different. Okay. And, and that way, searching for a program that's exactly this program, that's the best program, is already a fucking stupid search. Mm -hmm. It's like searching the optimal way to get from San Francisco to Sacramento. Well, like, what are the traffic conditions like? Is there like a cow dead in the road or whatever kind of farm shit you motherfuckers have out mm -hmm. here? Three to four sets, uh, three to four exercises-ish. So there's actually landmarks for how many sets. There are no landmarks for how many exercises. So it generally seems to be that anywhere between three and 12 sets per session per muscle is something like optimal. But if you're new to an exercise, it's probably like two or three sets. Yeah. 
just imagine like doing hack squats for the first time. And someone's like, we're going to do six sets. And after two sets, you can't walk. You're like, what, what more are we trying to achieve here? And the answer is any more, just more damage and it's less growth. So when you, a new variation or a very good one, set two to three sets. Mm-hmm. And then after a while you get used to it, you need more sets to do the same thing. All the way up to about 12 sets. They've shown that anything north of 12 to 15 sets per muscle yeah. in one session, what happens is you get so tired towards the end of that, that your muscles are no longer recruiting themselves. Your brain can't recruit your muscles. Mm-hmm. And that's called junk volume. Like if yeah. you started doing laterals with the thirties, set 15, you're doing them with the fives. You could ask us the question, okay, are the fives really heavy enough to stimulate the fibers that I want? And the answer is of course fucking not. Mm-hmm. So what are they giving me? Mm, maybe some metabolite stuff, but by then you may be so tired that you're not even getting a burn. Yeah. You're just going through the motions and that's a bad idea. So I like to think that anyone who claims to need more than 10 sets per muscle group per session, I'd like to train with them to make sure their technique doesn't suck. Because mm-hmm. with good technique and proper loading and taking every set relatively close to failure, holy shit, you do anywhere between five and seven working sets, you're f- most of the time fucking golden. Gotcha. Right? So people are like, oh, you did 20 sets for quads in one session. Yeah, sure you did. You call them sets, but they were just bullshit or easy or such terrible technique that you need more sets to do the same job, which mm-hmm. is where partial range of motion fails again. You do quarter squats, you can do a bunch of sets. They're like, oh, your quads pumped? You're like, no, but my hips are going to (laughs) die. You do some full squats, your quads come off the bone and your hips feel fine. So three to 10 sets roughly, three to 12 sets per session. And how you split that up between exercises is a bit more of a nuanced thing. The reality is you can just do one exercise per muscle and get 95% of the growth you ever were going to get. But some exercises get stale and sometimes muscles have like distinctly different actions. So for example, your quadriceps, they can extend the knee and they can also flex the hip with just one of them. So if you have some kind of hip flexion work or work at a different angle to get the parts of your quads that don't just do knee extension, then you can do two exercises or something. Hamstrings, there's the hip hinge component and there's the knee flexion component. Mm-hmm. You can do some kind of leg curl and some kind of hip hinge, like a stiff like a deadlift, but you don't need to do them in the same session. So like when I train hamstrings, I have two hamstring days or two leg days per week. One of them I do leg curls. The other I do like a uh, stiff legged deadlifts or good mornings or a hip hinge. And then within the week, both parts get hit and you're totally golden. That's like lifetime permanent infinity growth. So you don't need to do 18 different exercises every time you come to the gym. Unless there's a girl you like and she's doing a machine. It looks like you're doing. And she just got there right when you finished <clears throat> your last set. But you're like, I'm staying for a little while. You start, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> talking her up. Like, yeah, man. How long have you been to the gym? She's like at all in my life or today? And you're like, fuck, I, I already fucked this up. <laughs> how, how does somebody understand um, <laughs> if a muscle that they're training is truly a stubborn body part? Because sometimes people will say, oh, my, my, my biceps are lagging. And it's just like, how long have you been training? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, do you really know if that's actually a lagging body part? Yeah. When, when individuals train longer, yeah. they can have a better telltale yeah. sign. So, so how do people know if it's actually lagging? So the correct answer is you've done a really high level of due diligence to the muscle and it still hasn't responded as well as your other muscles. And then you can ask the sub-question of what is due diligence? Well, multiple years of training relatively intelligently. Mm -hmm. So you see someone that says, my my biceps are like super non-responsive, but then they're curling like this or some shit. And you're like, ah, well, you try training them. (laughs) You may really like what happens because what you're doing is not training. Yeah. Um, but if someone has, you know, several years of roughly relatively intelligent training, mm-hmm. hard training, pushing themselves, their rate of gains is going to be quite slow compared to other muscles. Like their pecs are way bigger, much stronger, biceps are meh. And then you can say like, yeah, my biceps are lagging both physically as far as visual analysis. Like they fucking, they're small and everyone makes fun of you everywhere you go. Um, you tell people you lift weights and they're like, like, uh, oh, okay. Cause your biceps are small. Yeah. It doesn't matter what else is big really. Because what do people say when you flex, flex your muscle to get this, right? They don't yeah. like, you show them quad striations. You they're like, pull up what the fuck is that? Like, that <laughs> Weirdo, out. your soccer days are over, sir. <laughs> put your legs away. Um, so as long as you put in the good work mm-hmm. and then, you know, like people say like, oh, my biceps aren't responsive or they're lagging. It's all relative. Yeah, Lagging compared to what? They may grow slower than your other muscles. Mm-hmm. It's unlikely that they just stop growing after three years. It's just a slow go. And then you can say, well, you know, it's almost like a self-answering problem. Okay, problem, my biceps aren't growing. Are you doing all the right shit to try to get them to grow? Yes. Problem, my biceps are growing. Are you doing all the right shit to get them to just keep looping back? And at the end of the day, if you keep looping back and doing the intelligent stuff, and sometimes you look 
a bit of uh, kind of more complex problem analysis where you're like, okay, these exercises aren't doing the shit. Let me try some really different ones. Yeah. Bicep curls to where you stretch behind and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And if all that still results in slower bicep growth, then, you know, yeah, you're probably gen- just genetically going to have a more difficult time. That doesn't mean they're going to be small as some muscles grow steadily and slowly, but eventually get quite large. Yeah. So I wouldn't know anything about that because I never, never successfully grew any muscle. Do you get any body work done, like uh, massage therapy or anything like that? You and I have a very different understanding of what body work means. Uh, it involves the hands, mm-hmm. lotion, a private room, and another person. Absolutely nothing in common with massage after that. No. Oh. The body is touched. Ooh, the body. Parts of the body. What, what, what's the uh, address of this, this place? I'll, 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 I'll let <laughs> you know right, right after. Right. You Thank don't you. want too many people running there right now. Mm. Yeah. And we get right after a live off air. Good. I never get massages unless I'm like on vacation with my wife and then we get massages together. Mm. And then every single masseuse assumes that I am impermeable <laughs> and I can't feel pain and also simultaneously want to feel something. So they try to bash my shit in the whole like, yeah, we were in Thailand and this woman climbs onto my back and mm-hmm. begins to step on me. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I can also feel pain. I know it doesn't look like it, but um, I'm not into pain and um, it doesn't do shit for me. Where do you think that pain comes from? Because like uh, in listening to someone like Kelly Sturette, like he is kind of a believer that uh, you should be able to put pressure on some of these muscles, even when the muscle is pretty jacked. And it shouldn't necessarily hurt. So is that like... That's like 50% of my jiu-jitsu game gone, if that was true. Is there some deformity in the tissue for some... What the I, I know, fuck are you saying to me? Are you saying I'm deformed? Yes. Without looking at my head? You're very deformed. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> now, Please. jiu-jitsu is a little different. I mean, you're, you know, you're putting knees and elbows like in certain areas. But I, I'm talking about like if someone's digging in on your forearm, well, bicep... That's what a calf slicer is. It's like mm. literally a jiu-jitsu machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's mm. no like... There's not really a way you get used to that. Somebody can yeah. slice your shit. So... Um, uh, with all with all due respect to Mr. Strutt, he's not clear to me that a, a resistance to, to tactile pain is some indicator of a healthy muscle or something like that. Mm. Maybe it's just you got used to being massaged and now your your sort of tactile pain response is smaller. Mm. That's cool. But like um, I've looked deeply into the literature on massage and uh, when they factor out the fact that massage is a subcomponent of a bigger category called compassionate touch, it sounds exactly as sexual hey as now. it is, by the way. Human beings like to be touched. I don't have to tell you fellas that. Nope. <laughs> a lot of elbows. If we were closer, it'd be yeah. a lot of elbow stuff. So, um, <laughs> and it turns out that's for many people very relaxing. And the relaxation is like a super drug that makes everything better. If you can stay more relaxed throughout the day, especially if you can find time in the evening to relax, if you can mm-hmm. good night's sleep, oh my God, I'm unbelievable. Probably the way sauna works best is if you think sauna is relaxing. Like a bunch of Russians, they get in there and they're like, this is the fucking awesome shit. I fucking hate the sauna. I'm like, we're in a room. Oh. <laughs> Nobody's wearing a jock strap, which is bullshit, <laughs> but they actually, they're usually naked at that point. No, I like the mystery. I don't mm-hmm. want to see your fucking dick. I could have told you that. It's you like, had one of those. It's like dude lingerie. Yeah. 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 Except, yeah I get it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I have like a nut hanging out, but no, not everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder what the other nut looks like. <laughs> <laughs> then you start Or maybe they just Daddy. have a mono nut. Holla. One nut at a time. <laughs> Mon- mono nut. They're like, what's the other one look like? They're like, I lost it in the war. You're like, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, actually, for individuals who've had one of their nuts removed, the mm. one nut actually gets bigger. Oh, wow. To, Yo. To one. He's like, finally, I'm alone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Time to conquer. Yeah, it's a Cyclops kind of thing. That's, that's it, really sweet. That's how it works. <laughs> Do you think like if you're in the hookup culture when you have just one nut, like you don't have to tell these hoes shit when you're with them and they're like, ooh, and they grab for it. Do right. you think there's ever a time where they, do you think they like, they're like, okay, don't make eye contact with them because shit's going to get weird. <laughs> Or do they look at you and you're like, yeah, yeah, I have one nut. Yeah, it's just one. You'll be the fiftieth person to fucking ask me. Mm. <laughs> just still can just fucking stop drawing attention to it. Anyway, where was I? Massage. If yes. it relaxes you, it is an incredibly healing experience that will absolutely boost your ability to perform in sport. Mm-hmm. It'll get you better hypertrophy, et cetera, et cetera. If it is not relaxing, it is probably net negative. So when I go to the massage places with my wife, I actually tell them like super, super light, easy touch, and it's a, often a language barrier. Um, and it's difficult to communicate. And so I st- st- start being a little bitch and I go, ow, when they do a normal massage. Cause to me, even a normal massage is painful as fuck. Mm-hmm. And so I tell them not to, and then they just like sort of light touch and they do the oils and the rocks and that's nice. Mm-hmm. So if a massage for you, if you have some sort of, um, medical dysfunction with your musculature, 
there may be a medical sport massage really difficult, really hard that could maybe do something to scar tissue, perhaps. That's an open question because they've done simulations of how much force it would take to actually change your scar tissue and it would be like enough force to puncture your skin by a factor of 10. Hmm. There may be no massage you can get that changes the muscles at a physical level. But if it feels nice for you, if it helps you modulate pain, great. But don't expect it to do that. And I think the number one ingredient for good massage is if it's relaxing. And if that's, if you get the same relaxation from someone rubbing your feet, <clears throat> rubbing your hands, rubbing anything else, your shoulders and SEMA, not, not what you thought it was. What about something different than like regular massage? Like there's different techniques, like active release therapy. There's people that are doing stuff to like fascia, but I don't know what's true and what's not. I don't know what sort of, yeah. if there's any evidence so, of so, any of these things. So I think the, the, the best hypothesis so far on that stuff is it is perceptual neuromodulation. Like when someone touches you and hard and it hurts, your nervous system changes its activity mm -hmm. to uh, sort of um, move the spectrum, move the line on how you perceive pain. And then all of a sudden that quad that used to hurt, now you got active release on it, it doesn't detect pain as much. And then you're able to do your stuff. And sometimes with especially old injuries and stuff, the injury is fine. The scar tissue is real strong but your pain modulation is still fucked up. So you're still like, you touch it. You're like, ah, oh, my quad, ah, oh, fuck, I'm hurt. You guys ever have clients that are like, ah, I'm getting hurt. You're like, no, you're not. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. So for them, some therapy like that may be effective, but the best candidate hypothesis now is that it's neural. It's not something physically happening to your muscle tissue that's different. Uh, I don't think anybody can change your muscle tissue by just massaging it outside of doing some muscle damage. You know, people get bruises and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But then that's like more like training. What's scar tissue? It's, um... When you've made a lot of bad decisions in your life, mm -hmm. you can't fall asleep because you just keep thinking about them. You guys remember that song, Scar Tissue, by the... I don't. No. Those white people that did lots of drugs. What's that band called? Nirvana? Scar <laughs> Tissue. <laughs> Scar oh, well, Beetle. there are a lot of them. Uh, red Hot Chili Peppers? Red, red hot chili peppers. I like Red Hot Chili Peppers, actually. Yeah, apparently good. not enough because you don't even know the Scar Tissue. I know, scar I scar know, tissue. but I, they're good. Um, scar Tissue is, uh, is a specific kind of tissue in the body that is formed after an injury mm -hmm. and that's only evolutionarily designed to do one thing. It is not designed to function, it's designed to hold things together. And that's a great thing if you're just trying to survive and replicate for a few more years and then cash out. But if you're trying to continue to be a high level athlete for another 10 years, scar tissue can, first of all, it doesn't generate force. And second of all, it can be positioned in such a way that pulls at other structures uncomfortably. Yeah. It reduces your range of motion. It can pull at other structures and cause pain. And it can also, if it's not sort of in the right spot, that scar tissue can be a weak point that can hurt again. Mm -hmm. So there's some scar tissue that's absolutely normal. I think, fucking God, we get it because otherwise it wouldn't recover at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, improperly positioned scar tissue, too much scar tissue, scar tissue interfering with stuff is something that a very good sports medicine doctor can look into and recommend a variety of therapies to maybe get that uh, situation a little bit sorted. But it's usually not required in normal training. So, so say this, something fucking has to be wrong with you. Like people ask me, the number one, number one reason I don't get massages, I, my body is fucking 100% fine. I don't have chronic pain. I'm fucking beautiful in my own skin <clears throat> yeah. to myself when I look in the mirror, which is often, mm -hmm. possibly all the time. And I don't need, it's like a, to me, in order for me to go pay money, again, I'm Jewish. Oh, that's like $1,000. In order for me to get my money out of continually being invested and go get a massage, it has to be a good reason for me to do that. Yeah. And if it's not a... um Airport massage, Korean massage. You guys familiar with that? Again, not a lot of massaging going on. Airport massage? You know, by the airport, the places mm -hmm. by the airport. They know by, you're oh, in and out real quick. You're just catching that two-hour layover. But Send me all the addresses. Absolutely. Every time. <laughs> I'll just dump them in our permanent little drop box for, yeah. Are there you in that uh, you in that link? I think so. Excellent. So in any case, there has to be a good reason for doing something. And that's actually another thing that while I'm on here, fuck it, I'll say. Ice, heat, mm. contrast, all this other stuff. If you can't cogently explain why you're doing it and why not doing it, it'd be worse than doing it. I'm curious to your logic. A lot of people are like doing fuck contrast. I'm like, oh, what's I getting you? Like, you know, like recovery, like, like how? I don't know. And the answer is sometimes it doesn't do shit. Yeah. Um, and it does have subtle nuanced effects, but most of them are to temporarily improve your recovery at the expense of your ability to adapt. So you're ready to play faster but you don't get as many gains from that training. So all those modalities, cryotherapy, mm -hmm. heat, ice, et cetera, uh, ibuprofen, 
the you guys ever seen the con, um, compression pants? People put them on and they like I've seen those. massage and shit. They I've work. Never used those before. Right? So yeah. what they do is like when you train your legs super fucking hard, or let's say you're doing soccer practice at the mm -hmm. super high level, and you have practice today and super light practice tomorrow, and then a game, important mm -hmm. game. Practice today was hard as fuck. Normally your legs are like, oh, we'll do some hypertrophy. Why not? And because you overload from soccer practice was super intense, mm -hmm. you have edema. Like there's a ton of fluid in your legs and that fluid is brought in with like uh, components of your immune system that go and fucking heal you yeah. and make you better. But it turns out that much easier for them to heal you than to make you better. So a lot of that immune response is to actually improve. But that's like, you know, if you have a skyscraper and a thunderstorm or something and you break a window, you could say, well, let's take the time to replace how the windows even are, make them thicker. Jesus, that's a two week job. If you just replace the window, it's a one day job maybe. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a situation in which you have to just be recovered, not better at a muscular level, it's good to go in there and put on the Normatec compression pants and they actually take all that immune fluid or a lot of it and just push it right the fuck out. So it's like your body's getting to work on itself and it's like, yeah, JK, <clears throat> time to go, right? The office building shut the lights down so the workers are like, we're fucking off. Yeah. And then you actually feel super good. You guys know that like post tons of running or post lifting, you're tight as fuck and you feel swollen. You're like, someone's like, can you play soccer? Like I used to be able to a day ago, but I feel tight. Mm -hmm. The tightness just never happens. You wake up the next day and you feel pretty fucking good. If you do that after every session of soccer, you will adapt much less. You will, your legs will not get as muscular. They won't get as endurant, et cetera but you'll be able to play real soon. So a lot of those techniques we get from people, like elite soccer players, after practice at like Manchester United or whatever, they walk into a fucking giant cryotherapy chamber and boom, they do that. Why? Because they have to be fucking ready in yeah. two days to play the highest possible level. But if you are a lifter and you're doing that all the time, you're actually fucking your adaptation mm -hmm. and you don't want to do that. So the best thing you can do, almost ever, and the best thing you can do to get more jacked after you're done training, is not ice, heat, whatever, whatever. It's sit the fuck down in a comfy chair and have lots of super nutritious food and relax. And that's how you grow. Yeah. Now that makes a lot of sense. Like for example, we, we use cold plunges, um, but I would never cold plunge after a lifting session. Right. Cause you you're like going to cancel out some of the adaptations. Like, exactly. The you plunge? know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll space that out to maybe the next morning or something like sure. that. Um, but I have found personally because I, like I uh, do so much activity, I have found like it, it's weird. I'll, hop into the cold plunge in the morning and maybe it's just like right after, but I will feel, then I know feeling is relative, right? But, For sure. It could um, be valid. Yeah. But over time, like I will like feel certain things just kind of get better fairly quickly. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So the, it's an interesting thing. Like it's, it's, it's something that you need to do. There's a time and a place for it. And you can't just think that's going to be magical recovery. But I do think that there are certain benefits to some of these modalities like ice and heat. Like I saw it quite, quite a bit. I do understand though that like it is causing extra fatigue, but it is something that helps me sleep deeply. And that might you know be worth I mean? it. And, and you know, so that's, do you, that's like, do you like being in the sauna? I, I, I would say initially when I started sounding a few years ago, it was difficult, but I knew it was going to be something that I had to get used to. Um, now I do enjoy it, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't change the fact that after like 30 minutes, it's difficult. But, yeah, sure. But, and that's what I was actually going to ask you. Do you think that like, for example, someone finds massages painful and somebody digging into their muscles painful. Like when I started using um, mobility tools a few mm -hmm. years ago, like the supernova from Kelly Stratton, those things, it hurt rolling mm -hmm. my hamstring on it. Mm -hmm. But I was like, okay, let me just slowly get myself used mm -hmm. to this. Now, not like massages, it, it takes a lot for an individual really to be able to, I'm not trying to look for pain, but I don't feel pain when they're really digging yes, into certain muscle groups. Different pain modulation. Because I've adapted to it. But, you know, so I'm wondering, do you think it's beneficial for athletes to adapt and get used to that? Yes. Or is it is it not necessary or helpful? Yes. If in attempting to train, they experience pain that interferes with their ability to train mm -hmm. and something like a foam roller can reduce their pain modulation such that they can train productively, assuming mm -hmm. there's no underlying like, well, you actually should be hurt because your quads on one fucking tendon um, or one little string. Yeah. If they're actually fine and it's a pain issue, which is a lot of injuries are just pain issues. Mm -hmm. um, if the modulation from the foam roller can over time make that better, it's absolutely a fucking great idea. On the other hand, there's lots of people that are like, what does the foam roller do for me? It's like, do you have a reason to use it? Like, no, then don't fucking use it. Yeah. Okay. Or use it creatively. <laughs> you insert it uh, Something that I find really interesting, it would be interesting to see if independently they would study heat and or cold along with just being alone with yourself for X amount of minutes. Because people, people with, are with just- With yourself and God or no God involved? With yourself and a bottle of lube. <laughs> 
and a butt plug. God's always there. Mm. <laughs> if if you like, if you were to do that for ten minutes, because I think that one of the one of the greatest uh, things you can do is just, as you mentioned, like just fucking relax. Yeah. Now a cold plunge is not relaxing when you first do it a couple times, and no. same with the sauna, but you do get used to it. Yeah. And it is an opportunity, and especially the cold plunge, like you're not going to really be fucking around with the phone. So it I, also I know the cold has a particular therapy to it, but I'm just saying, I, I sure. wonder in comparison to like recovery over a long time, yeah. I, I, I would kind of, I would kind of guess that the results would be similar. So, so I'll tell you this, like all the research on massage, they really can't tell compassionate touch and like sport massage apart as far as recovery. Mm -hmm. Like if someone who is friends with you comes over a little bit, a little college And this goes up, with a... Uh, uh, like PT as well, right? Like there's, it just takes time for injuries to fix. So yes, we don't know like if the the uh, TKEs I'm having you do are fixing your knee or if it was just the six weeks that passed by. Uh, sure. And you know, there's more and less intelligent ways to get at that problem. But like if somebody comes over and just gives you a back rub, on the average, for the average person that is just as recovery promoting as someone with a, you know, a white outfit on who is a massage specialist, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, unless there's a specific injury or no susceptive area they're trying to take care of. Like I'm always pain. I've got too much pain in my traps. The bar really hurts. And they can really get at your traps Do the same thing that a foam roller does. Um, so yeah, there is validity to it, but man, it's hard to beat just relaxing. And then a lot of the thing about the cold plunge stuff, you're not relaxed during, but after there's a huge wave of relaxation. Cause you're like, yeah. oh, you really appreciate the fuck out of life when you're not like in a fucking cold, Mm -hmm. Thing of water. It's fucking yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I moved from Russia once. I don't have to repeat that shit. Mm -hmm. I love that you're uh, drinking my favorite zero sugar soda. A and W. It's uh, it's American. That's my shit, dude. I love I that. Need. So, what does it's your most, diet look like right now? It's mostly root beer. Yeah, same, <laughs> same, same. Dude, we're like twins. Root beer diet. Bald head. Protein Hashtag. bars. Yeah, I got some protein bars here. Let's see. It's uh. At this point, you just get Pure calories protein. in, huh? Yeah, you know, like I, I so I, I keep track of my macros, and I do need forty three hundred calories to gain weight per day. And so mostly it comes from uh, healthy whole foods. But if I'm on the go, like I am now, I'll do protein bars and stuff like that. And I'll you're have, like, not big enough. No one's ever big enough. Okay, sir. Although I will say, like the last, I'm on a new massing phase now. The last one I ended. I lost a significant amount of ability to like touch my own neck. So like, cause my biceps grew, it's, it's physically impossible for me. So to wait, right now you're not faking it. You just no. literally can't touch. Damn man. Got the head and I have to crawl to get to my neck. <laughs> also on pulled on uh, pull downs. I go up to here. My shoulders are so big now that I sort of blood choke myself on oh, top. Shit. So I can't, I have to do slightly wider grip pull-ups or pull downs because I'll do here. And I'll be like, oh man, I'm like starting to pass out. Dog, what if somebody mounted you and then they try to get your arms above your head? Like they physically wouldn't I would, be able to well, get Well, yeah. Or arms. I would choke real fast. <laughs> oh so it's a huge battle there. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Being big sucks. He's don't choke out by his own pecs and shoulders. Like, like yeah, I think he lost to himself that time. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about something because I DM'd you the other day, um, ask you a question because there's a friend of mine. You did? But this is actually. Which, which account? Because I, I swear, straight up never saw that shit. It, it was your new one. Because I didn't even know you had a new account until recently. Then I followed the new one. Then I DM'd the new one. Yo, but don't, don't, no, don't worry you about it. You don't need to answer it now. No, no. Oh, <laughs> like, pause. I, I will. Um, He's going to answer. Just oh, I no, just no, no, seen no. this, bro. <laughs> just seen this. No, been busy. But I want to say this. I don't want to name any names here. Because this is, this is something I think a lot of people can benefit from. A lot of young guys, because of what's going on on social media now. Um, a lot of young guys are starting to hop on stuff and they're starting to do stuff based off of advice they see on people on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, but you also see a lot of bodybuilders just getting themselves fucked up because of a lot of different factors. Um, so a friend of mine who has really good genetics for bodybuilding uh, worked with somebody in the past. And this person, because they saw that he had great genetics, they started just blasting with a bunch of shit. They didn't care about his later outcomes. It kind of messed with him a little bit. And it was because they're like, well, let's throw the fucking kitchen sink at this kid and mm -hmm. he'll probably grow and it'll look like a great before and after. But a lot of these compounds are if done unsafely are fucking dangerous. Yeah, for sure. So my question to you is if an individual is interested in getting into bodybuilding, getting into the hat side of bodybuilding, number one, how can they make sure that they have longevity intact? Because 
this individual that was working with him said, you're young. You have nothing to worry about. Those no, were no, the exact backwards. words. You don't have nothing to worry about here. Like your body will be fine since you're young. You can damage yourself and not have to notice until you're 45 and you're going to die fucking tomorrow. Right. So how can, the, how can they make sure that longevity is, if they're looking at somebody or they're getting advice from somebody, how can they make sure that their, their longevity is in play? And then secondly, who are some people that on the enhanced side of yeah. things are responsible to help people out? Yeah. Because there's so sure. many so many people who are like, oh, Tons. yeah, I coach these people. Yeah, yeah. They just throw a fuck ton of drugs at kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Broderick Chavez, Team Evil GSP. There's Joe Jeffrey and, uh, at the Physique Collective. And um, those are probably my top two guys mm -hmm. for knowing shit. And they have tons of podcasts, tons of like uh, articles, tons of vi videos about what is called the safer use model. Okay. Like if you don't want to die, die, but you want to roll the dice a little bit, here's how you're going to do it. And they have dosage ranges, compounds to probably take, compounds to probably not take unless you really need to, how to use ancillary drugs, how not to use them. Like anti-estrogens are really bad for your health, so don't use them either at all or almost ever, et cetera. Mm -hmm what kind of blood work to get, what to look at in your blood work, what kind of um, adjustments to make if things are not where they're supposed to be. Yeah. So that all is out there. One really great proponent of it is John Jewett. He's an IFB pro, super sharp guy, actually has a master's degree in nutrition and he has like a J3 university or whatever, super cheap. You sign up and you get to learn all the stuff in a really slow, steady way. And so if you just collect, you know, take a few days for yourself to read all these guys' shit, the next time you're, you know, you want to coach and you're like, hey, what would a plan look like for me? And he's like, we start with a base of trend and then we sprinkle D-ball powder into the trend. You inject that too. You're going to be like, oh shit, this is really different. And probably I also know why it's wrong. Because these guys don't say, hey, just do it this way. These guys say, here is what the goal is. Here's what the limiting factors are. And here's how this attends to making your goals as good as possible, minimizing limiting factors. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a cycle design, different drugs that violate like three of those principles with references as to why that's a bad idea, then you're like, oh, fuck, this guy's just fucking wrong. Yeah. Because they're absolutely, and seeming to your point, there is a lot of, there are a lot of coaches in pro bodybuilding who want their guys to do as well as possible under them now. And that means they could be rushing them into a lot of gear. And there's guys taking unbelievable amounts. And of course, the retort is like, well, it's just fucking what it takes. Well, maybe. But maybe try the safer use model and see if you can get pretty fucking jacked. Uh, so like I've off season never been on more than 1.4 grams of gear, which like I'm 5'6 and 250 and I have like veins in my abs right now. Like that's pretty neat, you know? Like there's guys who took way more shit and got much smaller than me. How did I do it? Well, I gave it a chance. Could I have just gone into psycho doses? Sure. I would have never handled it mentally because my anxieties be too high. Mm. But if I could, I would just be like, well, I guess that's what it takes. And I could be a little bit bigger and a little bit leaner. But try the stuff that's good for your health. Try taking time to grow. And if that works and you get super jacked, then at some point you may have to make the choice of, ooh, I'm going to have to do some shit that's not good. Or not make that choice and just be super jacked and happy about it without ever having to take crazy risks. So try that easy road, good road for your health first, and then at some point you can make marginal trade-offs of like, well, I took third place, I need to take first, trend gets put in, it gets increased, blah, blah. But if you start with 900 megs of trend, <clears throat> you may you may have achieved almost all of that with much less gear and with your health as well. So, and another thing is like, um, get a second opinion in general, have somebody else look at some shit, mm -hmm. and also realize that shit takes time. Uh, some guys want to be amazing right now. Uh, and that's just not, it's not in the cards and yeah. it's not even in the cards for people who take boatloads of gear. Like mm -hmm. you'll see guys take a, a ton of gear and they're actually a bit more jacked year after year. And seven years later, they're the most jacked. Like, okay, so even taking all the fucking gear in the world didn't make them maximally jacked after one year. So what the fuck am I doing with it? Yeah. And if you're younger, you also have more time in the sport and more time to get situated, more time to grow. Another thing is you, Maybe you have like some semblance of a hazy idea of what your life could look like after the sport. And like, what do I, you know, I'll, at some point I'll turn 42 and I'll no longer be bodybuilding. And like, maybe that's it for my life. But maybe like that's when a lot of good stuff in life begins is you find, have some money, your family situation's more stable mm -hmm. and you can do a lot of shit and you're smarter than you've ever been and you know a lot about the world, et cetera. You have a, a good paying job. And if that, at that point, when you're in your early forties, all that shit you did in the gear catches up to you and you fucking croak, fuck, 
But if when you were 27, you know, pretty sharp people around, you could have seen that shit coming. So when you start uh, on your enhanced journey and say, I want to get fucking jacked, think about, okay, great. That'll be a cool thing to do for a couple of decades. What are you going to do after? Yeah. If the answer is I won't be healthy enough to do anything, maybe you fucking roll the dice wrong. Maybe you should have thought that shit through. But a lot of people don't think shit through. They're just like, fucking, I need to be the best bodybuilder ever now. Like, word up. <laughs> you will pay for that shit. There's so much more stuff to get to, but we're going to let you get on out of here. Mm -hmm. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Sure thing. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Please like today's episode on YouTube. Drop us a comment down below and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already. And uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all over the place. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Seema. Where are you at? Go join the Discord. The links in the description. That chat and Seema Yin Yang on Instagram, and YouTube, and Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Twitter, Doctor Mike. Where can people find you? I was going to be impressed with how fast you said that, and you fucked it up. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on Instagram. That's no fun. Doctor Mike Israel. I'm also on TikTok. Um, uh, yeah, it's the same shit as YouTube. We just repost it. YouTube. <laughs> that's where to find me. YouTube Renaissance Periodization. If you can't spell that, you're like everyone else. So just type in. Some batshit <laughs> shitty version of my last name spelling. Dr. Mike, muscle growth hypertrophy. Type it in the old YouTube search bar. You can get a channel and subscribe to the channel. And you will start receiving pictures of my genitals very shortly in very the mail. Cool. We actually send them in, in regular mail. We put an envelope of mm. pictures. We is don't do email. Nice. Is it harder That's to nice. like track that way or like? <laughs> Shh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's easy to track, which is like a more genuine experience. Mm. Because for years, we've all been receiving like dick pics on our phones. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah. But if you get an envelope of physical pictures, feel special. Oh, I mean, that's a serious. Somebody cares about you. I was yeah. surprised it was care. a sticker. <laughs> that's what really knocked my socks off. I was like, "Wow, that's this, an I extra put this on my water touch. bottle." You this want to put the pictures dope. in places where you like seeing them? Yeah, that's great. Good, Good question. Go hands free. I gotta ask this before we go. The tattoo on the left shoulder. When did you get that, and what did it stem from? Oh, uh, there's also a tattoo on the right shoulder. Oh, stop. Yeah, I thought it was an. Oh, it's yeah. an S for smelly, right? So that's a, that's that's a tattoo. Finishing. As soon as I saw the bigger, stronger, faster movie, I was like, "That's it." That's I it. have a new hero. I knew it. A new future father figure. God damn it. <laughs> Um, thank you for asking that question. Yeah. I don't, uh, I was in my early twenties. Okay. They are both references to books by the author Ayn Rand. And because if I had a religion, the closest thing to that would be capitalism. Okay. Yes. And some of your viewers will get triggered at that, but I will remind them I am infinitely more capable of understanding that system and defending it than they are of attacking it. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding at all. So voila. I guess that's controversial. It's not controversial. It's not that controversial. Yeah. What's the book? So this one is, it's actually the cover art for mm -hmm. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Okay. Um, and then um, this one is kind of intersects a bunch of her books, to be completely honest. But um, Atlas Shrugged would be the direct reference. Okay. But uh, the idea is like, it's not just the tattoos aren't, for the books it's for what the books represent and really it's not anything mystical it's like if you want to be a good person you should be capable at doing things you should be self-reliant and you should never hurt other people and try to produce as much valuable content as possible but we need the is. government to help us sometimes but i would say <laughs> only marginally and as little as possible we're not smart enough well i mean some of us are definitely not damn I need the government to do everything for me. I don't even make my own sticker pictures that I sent to people to put on their <laughs> See? refrigerators. That was, it that was made for in China. Refrigerator. I don't care where it's made. Can you imagine just being like a regular Chinese person who jobs makes stuff? <laughs> Why are these people naked and ugly? This guy's definitely Jewish. <laughs> uh, Mr. Winky's not that long. That's why the joke is funny. He grows, uh, though. Mm, I tell people that. <laughs> I sure do say that. Mm, yeah, I was being shy again today. Like, are you a shore or a grower? You're like, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Neither. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me, guys. It's an honor. I'm at Mark's Melly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.